Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the Post-Corp 27 Hong Kong Forum, co-organized by Business Environment Council, Civil Exchange, HKUST Institute for Environment, and the Divisions of Environment and Sustainability. I'm BEC Communications Manager, Red Lee, and your host today. To kickstart today's forum, may I invite Mr. Kevin O'Brien, Chairman of BEC, to give his opening remarks. Mr. O'Brien, please. Allow me, I'll remove my mask. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, a belated Happy New Year to you all. And I'd like to wish you all a warm welcome to this post COP27 Hong Kong Forum, co organized by the Business Environment Council, Civic Exchange, and the Hong Kong UST Institute for the Environment and Division of Environment and Sustainability. I'm so excited to kick off our 2023 diary with this important event. Collaborating with our long-term partners and BC members, Civic Exchange and HKUST. It's also a great pleasure to see so many of you here in the room today. I asked Simon earlier, is this a uh, hybrid event? And it's the first non-hybrid event, first non-online event for a number of years. So it's great to be uh, getting back to normal, as we say. In the 27th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or COP27, to make it easier for us all, held in Egypt in November last year, we witnessed an important mindset shift of the global business community from making pledges to deploying concrete actions to decarbonize their business. This positive move is welcomed by the BC, and we are always keen on driving business ambition into action on the net zero journey. On top of that, we are glad to see a breakthrough in COP27 from decade-long discussions to support the most vulnerable and least developed countries disproportionately affected by climate change by setting up a loss and damage fund in which countries responsible for high carbon emissions will compensate vulnerable countries suffering from climate impact. With this background, we are organizing this post COP27 Hong Kong Forum provide some of Hong Kong's COP27 participants with a platform to share their major observations and insights with the Hong Kong business community and other key stakeholders. Throughout this forum this morning, you will get some key COP27 takeaways on climate science, climate negotiations, and young talent perspective, shared by specialists from HKUST, the European Union Office, and Civic Exchange, respectively. Moreover, you will hear from a strong panel of speakers from different professional fields to share their views on the topics related to the pressure for decarbonization shifting to non-state actors and the transition plans on how we can deliver the change that is needed. I believe the sharing and discussions by our speakers today will certainly inspire us to formulate a more positive, encouraging, and yet realistic plan in Hong Kong that will drive our ambition into real climate actions, contributing to reducing carbon emissions and achieving a net zero future. I hope you will all enjoy the forum today and have a fruitful morning. And thank you all for those that are taking pl uh, part on stage today for your sharing and learning from COP27. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Now, may I invite Mr. Robert Gibson Fellow of Civil Exchange and adjunct professor of HKUST to introduce the various program in the first session of the forum. Mr. Gibson, please. Thank you. Uh, firstly, one administrative point. Um, we, while we're not hybrid, we are being videoed, and the video will go up on the internet for anybody to see. And you have, I believe, in, the, um, in applying to be here, agreed to uh, that. So anything you say will be public. Um, I would, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to be able to introduce Professor Alexis Lau. He's a chair professor in two divisions at UST, the Environment and Sustainability, where he employs me and very kindly arranged money for me to go to COP27, and uh, the Civil Engineering Division. Um, he 
His focus areas uh, are on energy, environmental engineering, and air quality. You may have heard of the praise system. In fact, let me, Alexis, just ask everybody, how many people have heard of praise? We need to get more people hearing of it, yes. Um, what I've said to Alexis is, because it, it's, you know, air quality is um, a big impact on health. And, you know, my feeling is that when you go to your doctor for a checkup, one of the things he maybe should be prescribing with is the Praise app, so you know when it's more dangerous to go outside. Anyway, um, Alexis uh, is prolific. He's um, co-authored 56 academic papers per your website in the last 10 years. And I would be very grateful if you can tell us a bit about the climate change science which drives what we do. Thank you. Uh, first, thanks very much for uh, the kind work by uh, Robert. I think Robert really helped me uh, understand more about, uh, because my background is actually a meteorologist. Uh, that's my training. But uh, not knowing too much about business, uh, not knowing too much about policy. But during the past 20 years, I think working particularly with civil exchange, with Christine, as uh, Robert, uh, learn a lot. And certainly, uh, I'm very keen on the environment, on how to improve that. And working with the uh, government, with business, is a must. And I think everyone here in this room knows about that. So uh, today, I think uh, I was given five to 10 minutes. So we are not going to talk very uh, much about the detail of climate science. But uh, since we want to launch this uh, post-COP meeting uh, with some solid uh, science, uh, what I want to do is just to remind a few important observations as well as, I think, important points on science. So I have uh, six slides, I'm not counting this one. Uh, so the first thing is an unfortunate uh, recognition is that despite we talk about uh, climate mitigation, climate change, uh, the emissions are still increasing. So with so much work trying to talk about how to reduce emission, uh, emission is still very much increasing. And if you notice from this, uh, the main increase is really from first from the fossil fuel, OK? That's the part that is quite clear. And another thing that is uh, being seen, actually, if you compare the width of the gray area, you would notice that methane has a small increase. Well, that small one is on the figure, but its impact is quite important. So uh, we will come back to methane a little bit later. But uh, this is something that sets the uh, I would say, the stage when we talk about the next thing. The other uh, reminder is actually uh, the film Inconvenient Truth. This is important. Uh, it's more important than I thought because uh, we have been uh, taking students from 2008 uh, after our program started. Uh, when we ask students, well, why do you want to study uh, the environment, why do you want to join the program? Actually, it's a surprising large number of students told us that they watch the movie and they are worried about the environment. So uh, sometimes we really have to engage every sector of the society to help because uh, we, as scientists, will never have the type of reach compared with, with a movie. And this is important and I hope that there are more of this type of activity. But uh, just a reminder what we are seeing. Uh, in this particular slide, I think a few points we want to make is that uh, we, at, at least in my class, I always like to test students whether they know what is the pre-industrial concentration, 280. Okay, So it's a number that is very critical uh, is 280. And then compare with the current one, uh, which is about now uh, 420. So the increase is about 140 ppm. 
And this increase compared with the pre-industrial compared with the last ice age, which is 190, actually our increase in CO2 concentration is about 1.5 times what the last ice age to the pre-industrial average, okay? Uh, we are not seeing the corresponding temperature change yet, uh, first because of a, a lot of nonlinear interaction, as well as um, the climate system has not stabilized. If we keep a long time this particular uh, concentration, the temperature will continue to go up. Okay, so, but this also says that we are now outside the normal range of the, uh, for the last, I would say almost a million years, okay? Then looking back at some of the AR6 report, this is, I think everyone here in this room is quite familiar. This is a rising trend and we already get 1.1 degree uh, Celsius increase. The last few years, you may see some type of a slowdown, but that is only because we are in uh, what we call a La Nina phase, which typically will have a cooling effect. But once we get into the opposite phase of a El Nino, actually it will shoot up. So, uh, but if you look at the long-term average, definitely we, we are on a rising trend. And the uh, IPCC actually do some analysis, the UN did some analysis, and instead of going into all this detail, I think one of the, this is kind of the optimistic uh, scenario. If we go for some type of current policy, then we will continue to see the temperature to rise. But if we are, if we are not quick to uh, change, if we want to get to two degree, uh, we need to have 30% reduction by 2030. Well, 2030 is a few years away, and this reduction is uh, very difficult. And then if we want to get down even to our 1.5 degree, that needs a 45%. So you may say, okay, this cannot be done. But if you cannot do that, then the next thing is you are passing this to our next generation. If we do it low, uh, slower, the more the next generation will have to do, okay? So I just want to come back to the methane question because this is something I think everyone should be looking at because of the permafrost uh, question. There's more and more evidence that the permafrost uh, methane is coming out. Uh, that's because the uh, polar region is warming faster than the rest of the world. It's warming faster because a very important feedback process is the ice are melting. The ice reflect a lot of sunlight. With the ice melted, the surface of the ocean uh, in that area actually will become dark, so they absorb heat. So there's a linear process in the globe, uh, polar region which make the polar region warm faster. But unfortunately, the polar region is also a place where a lot of methane is stored underground. If the surface melted, this methane can come out, and there's a lot of uh, measurements showing this methane coming out. And if this is not slowed down or stopped, that could uh, lead to quite a lot of uh, problems. Uh, I would will uh, get people here, if you're not familiar, I would suggest you to uh, go into that. But uh, for the methane, I think one of the, the three things I want you to kind of remember First is albedo. Secondly is the methane release itself, as well as now more and more talk about is the polar vortex. Uh, as a meteorologist, I can tell you, uh, a lot of the weather system are driven by something what we call the jet stream. The jet stream strength is controlled by the north-south temperature gradient. What we are seeing now is the weakening of the north-south gradient because the, the polar region is warming faster. So the pole to equator temperature gradient is uh, decreasing. What happened with that is actually the, just like if you have a string, if there is very tight tension, the string will 
became very tight. But if you relax the tension, the strain can oscillate much more. So we are seeing much more extreme event in the uh, temperature uh, in recent year because of the relaxation of this uh, temperature gradient. So uh, in terms of methane, we are worrying about being a tipping point. In terms of uh, the polar vortex, we are worrying about extreme weather. And then uh, the polar region also release a lot of water if the uh, Greenland and the uh, particularly Antarctica are melting. Uh, Greenland melting will give us quite a bit of water, which I will talk about uh, in the final slide. Anyway, the sea level rise is increasing uh, just with any other parameter we have in climate change. It's not just it's changing. One of the things that we also notice is the rate of increase are also increasing. And that's a very, very troubling sign. It's not just it's keep increasing. If you look at the sea level rise uh, for the past uh, 20 years, it's 2.1 millimeter per year. And then in the past few years, it's actually getting double uh, to 4.4 mm millimeter per year. But it's with a lot of parameter, it's like that. OK, so uh, there are some uh, scenario in the IPCC report, which we call low likelihood, uh, but high impact. This is talking about large increase in uh, sea level, which gets up to 50 meter by 2030, uh, sorry, 2300. But you may find this unbelievable, right? 50 meter sea level rise. But actually, it is not that unbelievable because if we think back, OK, IPCC talked about, this is my last slide, uh, IPCC talked about some of the scenario which they have looked at. Uh, a scenario called SSP 8.5, 8 which is something similar to a business as usual scenario. We are talking about the temperature rise from 3.3 .3 to 7.5. Uh, 5.7 degree. <laughs> but a lot of time when I go to conference, people talk about how to safeguard the city when there is 5.7 degree change. Sometimes it talks like, OK, everything is similar, and then we have a 5.7 degree change. Uh, I'm sorry, that I would not believe, OK? because. What do you see when we actually have a 5.7 degree temperature increase? OK? Actually, we don't know. But we know what is a 5.6, uh, 5.7 degree lower temperature. OK? Because that is the situation when we have the last ice age. The last ice age temperature difference from now is about 6 degrees. And the world that we have at that time is completely different from what we have now. The North American continent, half of it is covered by two miles of ice. Okay? The world where vegetations are and what we have now is completely different. So you cannot expect 5.7 degree increase, Hong Kong will still be similar. The land use all over the world will have changed so completely, you would not be able to recognize. So that is something I just want to impress you. We certainly do not want to get there. Okay? So a 5.7 degree world is not one you can recognize. I think that is a very important message. And then what the IPCC has been telling us is what we do in the next 20 to 30 years critically determine whether this is possible. And so I think we have really the responsibility of not putting our next generation for such risk. So thanks very much. Thank you, Alexis. So what are we going to do about it? So. Um, 
Walter. I would now like to introduce Walter Van Hattem, who is the head of trade and economic section at the EU office for Hong Kong and Macau, a position he's held since January 2021. His background is in political economy, development and business administration, uh, working on trade and industry and development policies where he has spent time with the International Labour Organization in Nigeria, the Dutch Foreign Service and Oxfam No, Hib, no Vib. Sorry. Uh, for the EU, he has um, helped establish a joint undertaking in Barcelona to support nuclear fusion development, which is something, by the way, the person sitting to your left studied nuclear fusion before he decided to do weather instead. Um, and um, he has worked on uh, humanitarian aid and health policies, and um, his work before he came to Hong Kong included time in Thailand, Indonesia, and the Philippines. So thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, uh, Simon, for inviting Kevin, Professor Alexis Lau. I, I, I think uh, it, it's, it's very uh, depressing, eh, your presentation. Congratulations. Uh, and I would start that actually this is not about the next generation. I mean, if uh, it's already passed on to the next generation. Eh? So actually, I do promote and, and hope to see many young people getting into this because us old people Oh, you are still young, Robert. But I mean, we basically failed, no? Um, so there we go. Uh, a few words uh, with a few slides also on the uh, COP27. Uh, and, and what I try to do is to reach a little bit of a positive end note, huh, but in, in perspective. Um, now, first of all, as far as the EU is concerned, uh, the European Green Deal is sort of what we wanted to bring to the COP27. So the ambitions we have made in Europe, which are quite large, uh, no net emissions by 2050, not by taking some measures here and there, but basically a complete overhaul transformation of how we work the economy, taking the resources away from the economic growth. Uh, we want to fast track that 55% reduction by 2030, uh, which would at least then allow us to say we did our part. But as you know, Professor, we are only 8% of global emissions. So if we do it alone, we wouldn't get very far. How we do it, uh, what we call leading the third industrial revolution, looking at how can you clean up all your production, your technology, energy reduction by 40% at least in the next years, renovation of 35 million buildings, a topic we discussed, I think, not so long ago in this forum as well, uh, making sure that the energy that we do use comes from renewables rather than coal, and doing this in a very kind of market-oriented way, namely due to our uh, quite, quite successful emission trading system, which already helped the EU to lower 43% emissions on the industries involved. We are challenged, not the least by some of the stuff already happening today, uh, as, as Professor Lau described, but also by Russia invading Ukraine and, and adding to the price of the energy cost due to that. It's not the only reason, but it, it didn't help for sure. Um, what, what it did do is that it actually fast-tracked the transition. And a lot of people before COP27, Executive Vice President was challenged because they thought that Europe would actually become less ambitious because the situation of war provoked us to find new solutions for our energy. And that didn't happen. Uh, and, and I'm very proud to work for an institution that actually held fast, held steady on, on the climate change goal, even if that meant uh, high inflation, increase in prices and uncertainty for many. Um, what we see today, I was at a briefing by one of the European banks the other day, and they said that by 2025, solar energy will have taken over as the first source of energy from coal. I don't know if this is a known statistic, but I was quite surprised by that uh, in a positive way. What did we want from COP27? Uh, slide two, I don't know if I need to press something. Oh, here it is, sorry, getting old. Um, we wanted COP27 to reconfirm actually our ambitions with regard to climate neutrality and the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And I think that really didn't happen. We also wanted to move on with other climate ambitions, mitigation work, uh, ending the inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, phasing down coal, didn't work either. We wanted to reduce methane emissions, 
and align the targets with the one and a half degrees and accelerate the adaptation to climate change work. Another pillar we looked for was to change the whole spectrum of climate finance. And I'm happy that colleagues in the room, including Grace, we worked it together. Hi, Grace. <laughs> um, sort of, it's not just about making sure, governments cannot pay for this. Uh, the, the trillions of dollars that are needed, four to six trillion a year, I think, uh, that needs to come from private sector. Now, how do you do actually make sure that private sector buys into it? And how do they do it that it actually supports our ambitions rather than plainly greenwashing uh, what's happening as well? And the EU wanted to show leadership, uh, to be a bridge builder in the world, to bring parties together. Now, on that point, I think we succeeded in a way that uh, when there was a stalemate on the, uh, uh, the uh, loss and damage fund, um, where the concern was from a lot of countries that someone needed to pay for all these measures, and the poor countries definitely cannot pay for that, then are the rich countries able and willing to actually support that? That was a difficult issue about the definition. How do you define a developing country? And, and we still use rather ancient definitions from 92. And I think Europe, Timmermans and colleagues, they played a key role in sort of getting an outcome where the agreement was that there would be this loss and damage fund, but that the definition of who would benefit from it would be a new definition of people who really need it, hey, countries. And also on the other side, donor countries also needed to be redefined. Uh, so that, I would say, is one of the outcomes. Um, where I earlier said on the one and a half degrees and the fossil fuels, we did not deliver. But on the loss and damage fund, I think there was an outcome. Also on adaptation, uh, there was quite a lot of pledging of new resources, uh, but not enough to actually help uh, the cause. Huh? Now, the EU took a number of other measures or initiatives uh, during the COP27, and even though these are all kind of small issues, I, I want to mention them because it shows that at least all these people being there, well, Robert, you were there, so you can say something more about it, but it was not all for nothing. Uh, just to give a few items, uh, together with the US and some other stakeholders, the EU spearheaded what we call a Methan pledge, uh, basically arguing that other governments and countries would join us in making sure that the methane emissions, which scientists say, I'm looking at Professor Lau, are much more polluting than, than the CO2, would also be brought under control. Now, to date, we have 150 countries already signed up to that pledge since we started last year. Uh, Europe's contribution to global climate finance. Uh, our commitments to the 100 billion needed are now roughly 250 billion euros or dollars worth. Uh, but we also try to advocate other rich countries to pay up. Uh, and you see that here and there uh, with increased contributions and as well a discussion about what constitutes climate financing. We did a lot on forestry. The EU adopted legislation last year that basically makes it possible for us to refuse products on the European market which cause uh, deforestation, uh, but we also pay up to helping countries to deal with that. So we launch partnerships with countries like Guyana, Mongolia, Congo, Uganda and Zambia to support them in, in forest ministry and biodiversity, and also some of the countries themselves, who are actually 52% of the world's rainforest, came together to start an alliance, and this included Brazil, Indonesia and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Other partnerships, uh, the EU and the African Union agreed to a partnership on climate change worth $1 billion, including a lot of measures. Uh, we had bilateral agreements with countries like Kazakhstan uh, and, and Namibia and Egypt on issues like raw materials and hydrogen. And then we have two uh, just energy transition partnerships, which are quite interesting to look further into, uh, together with other uh, uh, countries, huh? but that involved South Africa with a $8.5 billion financing to actually renew their economy and also a new one agreed with Indonesia uh, where the needs I think are roughly $20 billion to sort of support that transition and the EU already pledged around, the EU and partners, sorry, member states included, around $2.5 billion uh, during the recent G20. Now looking forward, a few notes on what we want to do with COP28. I think there the main thing that happened, and I, as a positive, 
is that partly thanks to this loss and damage fund, I think we have uh, a little bit of progress on what we call climate justice. Uh, and, and I've seen from, from the news uh, that the US Secgen wants to launch a meeting already in September this year to talk about the climate solidarity pact. Now, if only what happened in COP27 was a kick-starting of countries, of people, of civil society, of the young people, to feel more engaged with this kind of enormous dilemma, then I think we could take that as a positive. And I think towards the COP28, with all the cynicism that we could have, we should take this as something to work on. So climate justice will need to be at the heart of the negotiations for the COP28. Money needs to be put on the table, but I would also say there's a lot to say about inclusivity, transparency, and bringing people in at the right time. So actually, thanks to BEC and the co-organizers, because today is probably a good start to bring in Hong Kong. On the agenda will be the implementation. That's the other thing. We should go from words to action. How do you operationalize the big fund on loss and damage? And I think, Robert, you already had some views on how not to do that. So I hope they listen to you as well. Uh, the adaptation work needs to be more concrete. Uh, food, uh, not as high on the agenda as we wanted this as an EU in the COP27, but at least a start has been made to negotiate and to discuss issues related to food security and the role of food with regard to emissions. And then there's the global stock taking. My last slide, or single last one, is in terms of conclusions as far as I'm concerned for the EU, for what it's worth. So I think we made a step forward in terms of solidarity and climate justice. I don't think it's enough. Uh, as far as the EU is concerned, we want more. Uh, we want to take a leadership role in this world because we cannot do it alone. Having said that, we continue with great ambition. I have this beautiful slide, thanks to Franca, um, where we try to depict on the one hand, I think these are photos from a contest talking about what is the concrete result of climate change in your environment. And I think these pictures are taken partly in Europe, um, but there's a lot more. But we also have a very ambitious program in Europe called Fit for 55, one of the uh, uh, comments that uh, Executive Vice President Timmermans made at the end of the COP is that actually the 55% reduction by 2030, we are already able to up that to 57% uh, because we took up a lot of legislation in the EU, some of it still ongoing, uh, to actually make our economy completely different. And that goes as far as energy efficiency, transportation, production, circular economy. I mean, I can spend hours on all these initiatives. My last point I wanted to make before we go into the panel, but maybe also as a, as a start of that panel, is that the EU wants to work in partnership, but the EU also wants to use all our policy force that we have to encourage, incentivize our partners to do the same. So actually we use our trade policy uh, for this agenda. Uh, this year, uh, I think already at the start of this year, you will see the final result of our work on the, the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is basically a way to use this successful emission trading system, not only within the European market, but also to start charging polluters who want to import into the EU market. We can discuss a bit more during the panel. We are also looking at uh, supply chain due diligence, uh, and this goes beyond uh, the reporting, which I think uh, Dennis will uh, talk about later on, uh, but it's also about the actual supply chains being in order. And, and so we adopt legislation that captains of industry need to be held responsible for environmental issues, but also, for instance, for labor issues, for the whole supply chain. It's a, it's a big piece of legislation, but it will hopefully make a change in how we do our business. Uh, last point, uh, sustainable finance, uh, I think very relevant for Hong Kong, and I really look towards Hong Kong for being the champion that it is on this issue, but actually to make sure that whatever we finance, with all the money around in the world, we do that to actually avoid uh, these scenarios that uh, Professor Lau just gave us. Eh? So let's work together on that. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I look forward to uh, further discussions. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to ask the other speakers for panel one to come and join us on stage. So, um, and in, to introduce them, uh, we have Dennis Wan, who um, is the uh, regional head for CDP, 
Um, last year, after 22 years of being a banker, working for Credit Suisse, um, with uh, postings which included being in New York and uh, Thailand and um, Tokyo, sorry, Singapore, uh, New York and Tokyo. Uh, after 20 year, two years of being a banker, he has done a substantial career change and he's now working for CDP, which is uh, the world's um, leading organization of collecting and making available information on corporate greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I also uh, welcome Hit Fong Law, who is uh, Principal Manager Strategic Planning and Group Sustainability at CLP Holdings. Uh, she's led the development of CLP's sustainability report for the last few years. In 2021, this included adopting double materiality assessment and referencing the prototype, prototype ISSB um, standards, the new standards which are being developed and are likely to be global. Um, she's also worked on CLP uh, climate scenario analysis and prepared the group's standalone report on climate disclosures for TCFE. So um, I'd like, Dennis, if you could go first and say a few words and then Kit, and then we can get into panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So. 22 years in banking, and now with the largest environmental transparency NGO in the world. Um, there's a little bit of a story in between those things, which I think is, is, is useful for you to know. Uh, that 22 years ended last summer. I went on a sabbatical with my family, and whilst enjoying myself traveling across the continental United States, thinking, well, I'm going to go back to banking later, I ran into a forest fire. And the, the kind of, the kind of uh, slide that, that Walter showed there. So I came back to Hong Kong a bit depressed, thinking, I've got to do something, and it's not banking. And I didn't know what. So I, I, I started studying the kind of climate science that Professor Alexis went through. I wouldn't have had time to do that before. All I did before that was just read headlines and feel sad. Uh, didn't know what COPs were, didn't know what the IPCC was, uh, didn't know the complexity of, of the, the problem. And funnily enough, last December, so a year and, and about a month ago, then I was sitting in a, a conference like this and I, I raised my hand to Grace, who's now getting a second shout out this morning, uh, saying, I want to get into the sustainability movement. I want to try and make a difference. And um, it was a really interesting conference. One of the interesting things that, that she answered a question on, actually, was from the audience, how do we encourage young people to stay in STEM subjects so that they can grow up, so that they can make a difference? And my feeling when I, I was thinking about that was actually, it's not the young people's problem, it's our problem might not have made that decision pre-industrial times to get us to this position, but we are the, the, the people who are in power right now. We have the authority, the companies that you represent, the financial institutions that you represent have the power to make a difference, to change how you do things so that we can meet these, these deadlines. Never mind the 20, 30 years, the seven years we've got left to cut 50% of, of, of carbon from, from the economy so that we don't end up in, in all of it. I know it's 45%, but I, I go with 50%, really. We've just got to shoot for this. We've got the power to make that difference. And I didn't know how to make that difference because it's such a terrifying thing to do. And just coming out of a professional career doesn't mean that you can, you can now, uh, I know what to do. CDP sounded like the most boring organization ever. I'm an accountant, actually. In the background, I'm an accountant. That's disclosure. That's reporting. What difference does that make? Gee, I want to go and pick up stuff off the beach. I want to change how waste works in Hong Kong. I want to cut carbon. What d difference does disclosure make? Uh, especially a, a disclosure mechanism that uh, operates off asking you questions. You've all ended up with the CDP questionnaire. It asks you, with great difficulty, 
what do you do? Do you do this? Is your board in charge of, of your, 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 your climate risk decisions? What are your su uh, supply chain uh, scope three emissions? Things like it's, it's hard to do. But what difference is that? And it's just like filling in paper and making no difference, isn't it? Until you learn about all of the complexity, which again, we are bombarded with now, what on earth is a, is, is a GRI? What on earth is, is an SASB? What, did, what was a CDSB? What is a scope three? I, I didn't have time to learn that until I had time off. But I then realized the difference between making recommendations, which is what the TCFD does, makes recommendations. ISSB makes recommendations. You should do this. You should rise to this standard. And then asking the question of it instead, does your board oversee climate risk instead of your board should see oversee climate risk. And now you as businesses are forced to write down an answer. You are forced to perhaps go and measure your, your emissions and then answer that as opposed to you should disclose your emissions. And that very act there, that very act of asking your question, do you? Not telling you should, but do you? will make you think, you know what, I probably should. And it will make, therefore, your, your business operate differently. It will make your financial institution operate different, differently. So CDP, I discovered, invented environmental transparency. 22 years ago, our founders had actually had that inspiration. You know what? Who's got the power of the 100 largest entities and organizations in the world? Only 30 of them are governments and countries. 70 of them are corporations, international massive conglomerates and corporations. If you can convince them to do it differently, then we could actually make great strides towards achieving all of the things that we have to achieve here. So by this year, well, 2022, we had $130 trillion of, of uh, assets from, from financial institutions demanding disclosure from over 50% of the, the listed market capitalization of the world's companies disclosing to CDP. That's how we have become the largest environmental database in the world. I'm really proud to say that, that in, my, in, in my eight months now with CDP, I know BEC. I, I applaud HSBC if they're here for sponsoring BEC and the Low Carbon Charter, which is encouraging many of your companies in Hong Kong to start disclosing. Because disclosure is the first act of, of, of measurement so that you can gain insight into t what you're doing so that you can take action. So I don't know if I'm going to have time to meet every one of you later or, or you come to me, but come and look us up. Look up CDP. Get in contact with me. I will put you in contact with someone who will help you make a difference. Um, so thank you very much. And that's my opening remarks. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. So, um, yeah, when I got the invitation from BEC to, um, on this and talk about reporting, I thought, well, you know, as um, companies, we love complaining about reporting. Um, it's just so complicated. It's difficult. It takes a lot of time. And admittedly, it's, it is indeed very difficult. We are on the other side of like CDP. We get a lot of pressure from um, the likes of CDP, um, from reporting framework and other, a lot of assessment, et cetera. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm actually here to applaud like all these things which we see and also learn from my experience that they exist for a reason. They exist to help us actually um, to save a lot of work. And as Dennis said, it actually opens the door to a lot of other things as follows. It's a tool for us to engage with our capital providers. It's channeling information um, to um, people who may be using it for their decision making be it um, like funding uh, decisions and investment decisions and or other um, from the civil society, a lot of the engagement and um, um, influencing, et cetera. So, but to start with, I'm, uh, have, we, we have to admit and we have to be honest that reporting is difficult. Tremendous effort is required and it's difficult for many good reasons um, or understandable reasons. 
firstly, the standards is evolving. It takes so many years for accounting standards for developed and mature. And ESG non-financial standard, they're only starting. And therefore, understandably, um, a lot of um, the pieces are still moving. The methodologies are evolving, like greenhouse gas accounting, of course. Um, the greenhouse gas protocol has been here for uh, many years now. And um, constantly, it's like anyone who picked it up will find that, oh, there are answers that it, the standard fails to provide. And therefore, um, there will be, again, like the likes of CDP and other technical providers to help fill some of these gaps. And then therefore, now they're also undergoing a new round of um, consultation to address a lot of the changes that have happened in the last few years. And I think what's most important, in fact, is actually evolving expectations. So amongst the stakeholders, um, and for example, like climate change would be a very good example. Like previously, when we report on our greenhouse gas profiles, reporting on scope one and scope two would be sufficient. Of course, now everyone wants you to um, disclose on scope three as well. Um, before having a target itself is good enough, but now we have to show that we have a credible time to back it up. So it's not just something that we say we'll do, but leave it until like 30 years, um, way after I've been um, retired, that someone else will pick it up and deliver it. And I think that's also reflected in a lot of the questionnaires that we receive and receive. But I think, um, in, in the COP, I think uh, reporting uh, with the emergence of ISSB and IFRAG, et cetera, uh, with some of these standards seems to be emerging uh, uh, to become the universal standard. I think there's some um, good development in a very helpful direction for companies like us. I think standardization would help provide clarity for both us in preparing the report and also users of these informations. Um, it will allow benchmarking and more importantly in driving um, performance. A lot of the time, like we are all very busy, like day to day we have to have our everyday tasks we need to deliver. And sometimes in the, within the industry, um, we may lose sight of what the external stakeholders things are important for us. So some of these standards are actually provide like a very um, simple and clear way for us to understand that, know what the stakeholders care about, something that you may not be um, thinking about every day or something that you take it for granted and not knowing that, well, actually you need to explicitly talk about those. I think governance is actually one very good example. Like people thought a lot of the jurisdiction and listing rules, they have um, CG requirement, but then how does it um, specifically relate to climate change is something that we need to be explicitly talk about. And we see um, it's actually also one of the major concerns of a lot of the investors. So, um, how do companies navigate this, especially for those who are only starting to do so? It's actually very simple, despite the very, um, um, uh, seems to be very complicated landscape. It's just start somewhere, start anywhere, because it's always a process, it's iterative process. Um, start what's most important, what's material to, to your company, and start talking about it. And as said, it's an, an is an iterative process, it's a door to engagement, and then using that tool, um, you will be able to get feedback. Um, people will ask you more questions, uh, which may be annoying sometimes, but actually, um, don't be bound by your framework. When you hear what your stakeholders ask about, uh, many of them are asking the same questions, start putting it into your report as well. And that's exactly the experience um, of, of um, CLP. Um, when we first issued our Climate Vision 2050 um, back in 2007, we were um, the first Asian-based electric utilities companies to have a greenhouse gas intensity target. And at that time, we were um, um, the first to do it. It was good. But then over time, people ask more about it. People tell us they demand more because of um, the involvement of the climate science, etc. So we've been tightening our target several times over the years as well. And more and, and compared with what we um, published before, it may be just a few targets over um, up until 2050. But now what we talk about is a lot more is that we have a, a backup uh, uh, implementation plan. We have a transition plan telling explicitly how we're going to do and sometimes also explaining um, what are some of the limitations that prevent us from um, accelerating our decarbonization further. And um, the report, and I think that the likes of CDP is very important as an information depository, which um, again, where a lot of these um, other analysts make use of the information. So in a way, it's saving us work into um, getting the basic informations out 
um, our governance, uh, emissions, uh, risk management, etc. And riding on that, we also see a lot more other um, new climate-focused assessment emerging over the last few years, which are riding on what they get through CDP and then run their own analysis, run their own proprietary modeling and scenarios, etc. And I think it, it, sometimes it's also good to know that it's not only for us companies who are preparing the company that this is an iterative process, it's the same for standard setters as well. They may be starting sim um, in a simple way, but as I said, over the year, more and more information are requested, and therefore they are also um, improving or um, um, uh, enhancing their, their standard as well. But again, it's not to make life difficult for us, but it's really to make life easier for every one of us. Thank you very much, both of you. We, we have 18 minutes left and we could easily talk for an hour, so we need to be careful on our time. Um, very quickly on the reporting, there is a, you know, a once in a, a lifetime sort of revolution in sustainability reporting about to happen. We have the well, body which basically mandates the global standard for accounting going to issue standards for sustainability reporting. Um, and uh, we have the greenhouse gas protocols got a consultation out, reply by the end of February, please, as to how the greenhouse gas protocols should change. This whole issue, which was touched on briefly of scope three reporting, in my opinion, personal opinion, the way in which the global standard set ISSB is going is bad for scope three. It's asking every company to report all their scope three emissions. So that means that you have got to try and report the emissions of your suppliers and the emissions of your customers. A massive amount of information which will be difficult to do with any significant degree of accuracy and what's it going to be used for. Um, so I think that uh, the greenhouse gas protocol needs to be changed to move. We've, we've got uh, SK Wu in the audience from Allied Construction, which is Hong Kong's leading uh, ready mix cement supplier. I think it's got to be changed so his product is the same as Kit CLP's product. Namely, um, when you buy it, you get told what the carbon intensity of the product is, and then you can report as scope two, this is the quantity I bought times the carbon intensity, this is my carbon footprint from it. So when you buy cement, or concrete rather, both of them, you, you do that. But that's a long conversation and perhaps not for today. Uh, the, the conversation that I would like to have today is firstly, I'd like to switch and talk about something which Walter mentions, which is these just energy transition partnerships. So the deal's been done for Indonesia to be 20 billion uh, US dollars of funding to be arranged for Indonesia to uh, accelerate its deployment of solar uh, and probably not much wind because it's near the equator, but renewable energy and to close down coal fired power stations. Now, when you do this sort of deal, one of the things you find is those that own the coal-fired power stations feel this is not such a good idea. There's a lot of resistance. So it needs to be a really strong governance around this deal where, yep, yeah, the money's going to go in for the renewables, but also something has to happen on the coal-fired power stations. One strategy is that you, as part of the front of the end of the deal, you buy into the coal-fired power stations, and then you, on, on a deal whereby you run them down and you close them, at such time as the sufficient electricity generated by, by solar. And so we could conceivably see CLP buying a coal-fired power station in Indonesia. Kit's looking dubious at this. Uh, but for the purpose of running it down, somebody needs to do that job if Indonesia is to decarbonize. The other thing that relates to this is how, has, how does Hong Kong earn the money which we use to buy all the manufactured goods we import, all the food we import, all the energy we import, or what part of it is providing financial services. It's a really big um, positive on Hong Kong's economic trade. And in the past, we've been involved in financing coal-fired power stations in Indonesia and other places. Are we going to be involved in just energy transition partnership? Well, Standard Chartered and HSBC are involved because they're, they're part of the banking group that's trying to put it together. So I'd be grateful for any and all of the panelists to talk briefly about how can Hong Kong play a positive role 
in the JETPs. And it's not just Indonesia. There's the expectation is that there will be one for Vietnam in the not too distant future and other countries around the region. India is another one. Thank you. Who would like to take this? Yeah. No, I, I, just on, on Hong Kong, what's, what Hong Kong can do, and maybe I go a bit broader, but happy to hear CLP is going to buy the, uh, the coal plants. Huh? The one thing we learned is that uh, Europe thought we were depending on Russian gas. Uh, I, I mean, it's a bit off topic, but on the other hand, uh, we put our heads together. Uh, today, uh, the dependency on Russian gas is down, I think, from more than 40 to 50 percent. Today, it's roughly 6 or 7 percent. Whenever someone says we cannot do something, the whole Green Deal tries to show, well, actually, I mean, you said something, we don't have time for climate change. I, I'm twisting your words. Uh, Professor Lau shows, well, climate change is time for you. And so unless people start understanding that this is not just another crisis in, in the rule book on Monday morning in your office, it's something that actually necessitates dramatic changes, including on reporting, on standards, etc. Uh, and that's the same with dependency on, on coal and, and, and gas. Uh, but I do take the point that if you want to have this solidarity, the buy-in, not only of poor people and poor nations, but maybe also of industry, then you might need to come up with, uh, with creative uh, solutions. And I definitely agree with Robert that Hong Kong, I think, can play a big role in it. We had a previous discussion where a bit was about the question, how much can Hong Kong be a leader? Uh, and, and some colleagues argued, well, Hong Kong can be a fast follower. Yeah, on, on, on standards, on finance, on, on this kind of things. And I, I'm really new to Hong Kong, so I don't want to be sort of sounding too, too wise or whatever. But I actually think Hong Kong can be a leader. Uh, and, and I want to mention that now, because I don't know if I get the mic back. Uh, financial sector, definitely very strong in Hong Kong. You know, the market capitalization, uh, well, uh, Grace knows Hong Kong exchange, extremely powerful, good role to play. If there's any place, let's say in Asia or in this part of the world, where you can actually make changes on where finance goes and where it comes from, I think it's Hong Kong. The other thing is Hong Kong is a very open economy. Now, wherever in the world, if you would start a discussion against coal or against certain other uh, imports, people would immediately associate that, well, there's an industry behind it who wants to do protectionism and stuff like that. Well, Hong Kong, I think, obviously doesn't have that agenda. So you could be a platform, at least on the trade, on the economy side, to say, well, we are sort of a neutral partner in that because we have nothing to gain with it. Yeah? The third one, Hong Kong has a lot of money, the government. And, and we've had a number of discussions with the government to say, why don't you up the ambition? <laughs> Simon is laughing, but well, we do. Uh, why don't you up the ambition and make Hong Kong a green city, an example for the rest of Asia and the world? If there's any place where you can do that, in terms of public funding and private funding, it's Hong Kong. Now, there's a couple of mega projects coming around, but then make sure that your procurement rules and stuff like that really look after the green. The final point, Hong Kong is a bridge between East and West. Hong Kong wants to be that bridge between East and West. Now, on, if on one topic, climate change, and there is something where we really desperately need to work together above the geopolitics, above the political agendas, then it's on this. Now, I'm not saying that Hong Kong would be the preferred location to do so, but I think if Hong Kong chooses to take that leadership, I think Hong Kong can do that. No? I, I went a bit beyond. But okay. Um, also to digress for a moment, what, uh, what the professor was saying about ISSB, um, I, I need to chip in just a couple of things about ISSB and scope three. Firstly, you don't know what ISSB is you don't know what SBTI is you don't know what TCFD is don't worry you know what you got to do you got to disclose to CDP by answering a questionnaire you will be answering the kind of questions just as, as as Kit has learned that will answer the next question when those 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 questions come at you I couldn't explain to you what scope three was less than less than one year ago uh, it was a real revelation to me when I discovered that everybody's scope three is in fact made up of everybody's scope one and two. So measure your scope one and two, disclose it to, hey, disclose it to one central place like CDP, and then everybody's going to know their scope three. It's, it's like quite an, uh, a, 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 it was a revelation to me, OK? Um, on JetP itself, though, JetP, uh, we CDP do not exist. We, we, we can't make governments do anything. 
we can, we can offer them an awful lot of data. Everyone who's crying out for data and saying, data, 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 we're missing data, we will be waving here saying, yeah, we've got, we've got 22 years of data gathered from, from major companies and, and indeed jurisdictions and, and country, uh, cities and states and regions now we also gather from. So make your policies based on those. But in terms of simply business, financial institutions, um, if 20 billion is going uh, from, from JetP into Indonesia to, to finance a just transition, and 10 billion of it is coming from uh, the G7 countries, especially uh, the US and, and, and Japan, the other 10 billion is coming from financial institutions. From Indonesia's point of view, then it's not as as uh, as optimistic as as what uh, Walt Walter said by 2025 solar is going to overtake only 8% of of uh, of energy in Indonesia comes from renewables right now and 65% of it comes from fossil fuels so where financial institutions in in Hong Kong without having to wait for standards without having to wait for government leadership can just recognize it's a golden commercial opportunity to go in and lend the right thing but it's not just to, to oh, I'm going to lend to this instead of that. They also have to think of, of ESG factors in their, their decision-making criteria. They have to think about restoration. When we do buy those 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 coal plants and then close them down to, to rewild what 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 we've what we've ruined. It it is complicated, but it's a golden opportunity. That that's how it should accelerate. Yeah, and I just want to make a comment about just transition. So. Um, I think it's a very important concept, like when we talk about climate change, and it, it's not just climate that we're talking about because it's a holistic issue, it's a complex issue, and therefore there are a lot of things that we need to take into account. And it's just like running a business. I think the idea of sustainability is that it's not one agenda of profit making, but then we have to take care of our different stakeholders as well. And therefore, as an electric utilities, I think Climate change, of course, is very important, but then providing affordable and reliable energy is also equally important. And therefore, when we look at um, some of the like just transition, like what does it mean for us? Um, of course, we look into some of the standards and framework that are available. And it, it's one area that, again, is still evolving, is still very new. And I remember the World, Bus uh, World Benchmark benchmarking alliances when they first developed their just transition framework as an assessment um, in their first assessment in 2020 or 21 all of the 180 companies that were assessed only nine like nine of them could achieve a passing mark so does it mean that all the companies are not doing the right thing about just transition I don't think so and therefore we actually in recent year we see like new frameworks um, emerging which also look at more holistically including like um, um, universal net zero energy access, community resilience, collaboration, etc. Um, so I think again, it's one of these areas where the concept is very good, but then we, more works need to be um, there to define. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm looking at the clock. I've got in theory six minutes to go. I'm going to go a little bit over until someone shouts at me. But uh, very quickly on carbon border adjustment mechanism. So I remember being at the Copenhagen COP. And at that stage, there was lots of anguish in Europe because it had got the emissions trading scheme, the carbon price had gone up quite nicely to somewhere over 20 euros a tonne, and there was loads of cement coming into Europe by train from Eastern Europe where it didn't have to pay the carbon price. So my understanding Wolf, is you cured that one by giving free carbon credits to the people making cement in Europe, which of course meant that basically the carbon price didn't apply to them. This time round, you've now up to uh, I think it's about euros 90 uh, a ton uh, in the EU ETS. And um, with that price, obviously anybody bringing cement into Europe or steel or anything else carbon intensive is at a significant competitive advantage to people making it in Europe if you don't continue to give them free allowance and therefore um, <laughs> gut the purpose of the policy of having a carbon price. So. My understanding is that carbon border adjustment mechanism is going to be the cure for this. Can you say something very quick about it? And please, can you come back once it's formally announced and explain it in detail? No, no with pleasure, because it's one of these instruments the EU wants to use as part of our trade policy. To, uh, we show leadership in the EU. We cut emissions by 43% on the same industries that, uh, that were covered by the emissions. And we want to do that at a global scale. 
uh, there's been lengthy discussions. We want to make sure we are a strong propagator of the multilateral system. So whatever we want to put in place needs to be consistent uh, with multilateral trading rules. And there's been some debating whether or not this would be uh, as such. Uh, now the lawyers made sure we are. We, we have a proposal to be adopted. Uh, I mean, we have a commission. Normally the legislation works. Commission proposes something, then the council and the parliament have uh, co-legislation. And, and I foresee an outcome coming up not too long from now. What will be in there, it's not something that suddenly will happen from one day to the next. Uh, but the emission trading system will be expanded, so you will, for the same products that are now covered in Europe, that in case of imports, uh, if, if those companies cannot show that they are part of a similar kind of green way of production, uh, then they would need to pay uh, some kind of uh, money for these uh, CBAM certificates. Huh? As it is today, we are probably going to launch the system by October 23, so actually that's quite soon, but not with uh, any financial element in it. So at first we will ask companies to start reporting on it, and then gradually uh, the actual certificates will be launched and, and the, the money charged uh, starting from 2026. And so there will be quite a bit of time for industry to get prepared for that. And then the Commission will also do a kind of a re revamp to see how it's working already by 2027. Now the whole idea is indeed that to avoid having the same kind of industry being polluting in Europe, which we store, we, we sort of got out of our way, that it doesn't come in through the back door uh, in terms of trade. Now, innovative of it might be, I mean, the, the, the goods that will be uh, covered initially is iron and steel, cement, fertilizers, aluminium, and electricity. Uh, it might be extended to hydrogen. And then the discussion at the moment is also towards more downstream uh, products. Huh? Uh, so think about screws and bolts or, or other iron and steel articles. Uh, there's been plenty of consultations. There's a lot of information. Uh, but as I mentioned to Robert earlier, I would prefer to give a more detailed debrief once the actual uh, decision is uh, adopted. Thank you very much. So um, the last COP, the one we've just had and are reporting on, was advertised as being the implementation COP. The idea was that the Paris rule book had been agreed, almost, just the last bit to do, um, and it was to get on with implementing it. And after a lot of discussions, the Paris rule book isn't quite, still quite yet there. We still don't have the international carbon trading rules agreed and a few other minor points. Um, so the headline ended up, it was the loss and damage COP. Now, next year's COP is billed as being the stock take COP, because the once every five year uh, global stock take on how are we doing um, on um, all factors on uh, decarbonizing, on support for developing countries, etc. There's a once in the Paris Agreement. There's a once every five year stock take, and then what to do about it with the implication that countries should be inc or increasing their ambition following that. Um, one um, commentator has said, "Yeah, you know what it's going to be called? It's going to be called the carbon dioxide removal COP." Um, and the guy who is going to be the president is, is sort of in the news, I think, more or less today, is also the guy who's in charge of the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, which has just announced that it's putting 15 billion US dollars into carbon dioxide removal technologies. So very quickly from the panel, uh, your expectations as to what is going to happen leading to the next COP. Who would like to go first on that one? Yeah, I, I think um, with the selling of the loss and damage fund, I think adaptation will become like a um, um, big agenda and a big focus. And I, I think it's also in COP, it's kind of uh, people accepted that climate change is going to happen um, to a certain level. So I think as that adaptation will become very important. And the second one, as um, Rob just said, is that um, the nature agenda will become um, even more important. Um, just because, um, again, because credit and offset is gaining more prominence and um, there's a lot of advocacy on natural climate solutions and, and then, yeah, therefore kind of like expanding the climate solution into a nature agenda. Okay. Um, just to recap the, the 2022 loss and damage COP then, I wouldn't have understood it. I know I've said this many times, but I wouldn't have understood it were I not 
uh, you know, privileged enough to have spent time studying and understanding like some of the terminology now. So I am actually quite excited by what happened in 2022, not necessarily that COP, when CDP announced that it would be aligning with ISSB by 2024, so leading that way. We'll be incorporating green taxonomies as well, so the questions will lead you to the right way there. The US White House, the largest buyer in the world, uh, agreeing to measure its supply chain emissions through CDP, I wouldn't have known that that was a big deal, uh, but that did happen last year as well. The HKMA adopting a questionnaire approach using CDP questions and asking Hong Kong companies to, to disclose to, to their uh, new initiative. Um, that is another disclosure uh, initiative which is encouraging Hong Kong companies to do the right thing. And CDP going into the area of SMEs, knowing that some of our, 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 our high level, uh, our, our most full questionnaire is, is very complex and challenging, but SMEs needed a simpler level of questionnaire. That also happened last year. So you asked what's going to happen in 2023 leading up to this global stock take. The global stock take um, initial discussions, the technical discussions in Berlin of 2022, CDP was involved in those and made recommendations that corporations need to feed into the party NDCs. Um, and we're very proud to, uh, to, to understand that the UNFCCCC uh, of high level champions paper has started taking on CDP's recommendations. So hopefully we'll be seeing corporations feeding into party NDCs uh, by this global stock take. But other things that will happen this year in 2023 are that um, the ESRS is coming in Europe, and that is a higher standard than the ISSB. So the, the kind of complaints that, that, uh, that the professor has about the ISSB, the ESRS by mid-June, as long as it doesn't, if, as long as the Europe does not bow to lobbying, should should be holding European companies and the subsidiaries of, of our you know, Hong Kong companies that operate in Europe to a higher standard. So so taking them along the right way. So very exciting about that. Um, CDP will be expanding into bio biodiversity, into plastics. Um, holistically framing our questions along planetary boundaries. So it's not just about carbon, which was where, where we were founded 22 years ago, but it is hopefully challenging everyone to think bigger. Um, and there are some confidential things that I can't talk about either, but what we should see in 2023. But hopefully what we're seeing is, is just the world moving towards, uh, it, it, it's a done deal, the climate science is clear, transition planning, Another thing that, that we will we challenge everyone to think about, just accept that you must transition uh, and prove that you have credible plans to transition. Um, and and we, will, we will be able to do it. If I've learned anything, if I have one mantra that I, I have, have adopted this year is like, um, no one can do everything. No one person can do everything, but everyone can do something. And together we will get this done. So, so to answer your question, Robert, very good question. Uh, if we then consider the last COP to be like the climate justice COP or, or the climate solidarity COP, which it maybe not, but maybe it was the start of being that. Then for COP28, I think the realization that governments cannot solve this. So on the one hand, I think someone mentioned the young people, I think it was you, Professor Lau, cannot solve it because they are not in power. But the people in power cannot solve it because they are in power as well. So how can you actually bring those people who are not in power, but who will be actually flooded uh, into this equation? And I think for that, we need to look more at processes. Uh, and, and that starts today. Um, that's about solidarity, climate justice. Uh, the other part of the equation is industry. Now, we talk a lot about industry is, is OK with it, as long as it's profitable. Uh, the bottom line is profit. But then again, if the world looks a bit like what you were describing, Professor Lau, then there won't be any industry left. So for me, the two elements where we need to really focus on is bring in those people do, who don't have power uh, because they are too young or whatever, or too, too, too poor or whatever, and bring in those people who have actually a lot of power, which is industry. What you see today is industry is driving a lot of governments in Indonesia and in Europe, everywhere. They have a big role to play. Now let's put that force behind that agenda. And then if I may, last year, we organized what we call the Greenway event. Uh, Rethink was there, BEC was there. And the idea was actually that we come together 
with industry from both Europe and Hong Kong to see what kind of recommendations can we give to the government of Hong Kong, but also of Europe, uh, ahead of the last COP. Uh, and, and I think that was very successful. I just wanted to announce we do have a successor now uh, in March. We already have the uh, agreement of the financial secretary, Paul Chan, to sort of be the honorary speaker. I do count uh, Chris, but I think you're on board for sure, uh, Simon as well. Uh, I, I think it's an opportunity sort of bring this a bit, a few levels down. Uh, we cannot solve it here, but let's then see what Hong Kong can contribute to making the next COP uh, inclusive, successful, etc. Thank you. So you're all invited. Thank you. So we, we are out of time, but can I have a show of hands as to who would like to ask a question? One, two, three, five. Um, <laughs> well, I'm going to do it in order of I seeing the hands up. So can we have very quick questions, the three of them, and then we'll have final remarks from the three panelists responding. So John Sayer. Thank you. Uh, John Sayer from Deloitte Carbon Care Asia. Um, at COP, I spent a lot of time with the uh, International Chamber of Commerce and the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. There was a feeling amongst the business community that I detected that they felt quite marginalized. If you look at the final statements from COP27, there was more mention of indigenous groups, women, uh, trade unions, uh, than there was a business. There was almost no mention. Two possible reasons emerged when I, uh, on the WhatsApp groups with business community discussing this. First, the news came through in the middle of the COP. 636 fossil fuel lobbyists were at the COP. So let's close, talk about you know, biased representation. Second, COP consists of 193 countries. Uh, the majority are developing countries. The developing countries are asking for mitigation funds, for adaptation funds, and now loss and damage funds. They are suspicious that the developed country governments, when they mention the private sector, um, are trying to get off the hook and say, well, we can give you the money, but it'll be in the form of loans and, and blended finance and all of this from, from, from the private sector. And the developing nations say, no, we want money from you, the governments who are historical emission, uh, emitters and high emitters. So, what is the strategy for business? This is a panel about you know, non-state actors in COP27. What is the strategy for business to take back a kind of uh, positive role in the COP process and say we can play a positive role and not be, in that sort of diplomatic process, quite marginalized in, in the statements and the outcome? Thank you. Uh, Michael Adesis, you, I think, with the second hand up. Um, okay, so let's say that all these efforts at uh, uh, disclosure are successful, and in, uh, let's say, five years, uh, all companies are fully disclosing their emissions, all governments, and emissions have gone up at the same rate as before. What will be your recommended plan of action? More disclosure or do you have a plan B? The last question hand was at the back. Well, yes, please. Uh, yes, just to bring it to Hong Kong. Um, Hong Kong, oligopoly type of envi economic environment. We have six families that control almost most of the e economy in Hong Kong. Building on your messages of the non-state actors, why is it so difficult to get six people in a room and agree to make Hong Kong a more sustainable environment since they basically impact almost every fabric of society in Hong Kong? Uh, Grace, would you like to just very quickly have a point? Microphone coming. Okay. First question is to uh, Dennis. Um, mm -hmm. your, your banking skill set is definitely there. CDP is very lucky to have you. Um, but I just wanted to know when you have all this data that you have collected globally, when are you going to put it on the open source so that people can use it? Number two, uh, this is a question for uh, Walter. Um, I know you love Hong Kong. You have really spoken a lot uh, for the opening of Hong Kong, and I, and I thank you for that. 
Um, when are you going to help bring in the talents, which I know we have young talents later, which I have other questions, but I can't put that to you. Um, so when are you going to help bring in, you know, a lot of the, of the uh, knowledge, uh, especially in uh, products and uh, technology in the, in, in the green space to Hong Kong? Um, because we definitely need a lot of help in that area. Thank you. Thanks. So um, each panelist. Dennis, do you want to go first? Or? No, no. Yeah, we, we're, we're out of time, so just hit the key points uh, with your microphone. All right. what we do about, uh, with the microphone. If it's just disclosure, what happens in five years? It's never too late. If we miss 1.5 degrees, we'll shoot for 1.6, then we'll shoot for 1.7. We just can't give up. I mean, I'll tell you later when we when we failed at various hurdles, but we won't give up. Um, when will it be open source? We've actually con uh, agreed to uh, contribute to the Net Zero Data Utility Program uh, next year. We're, we're in plenty of talks to make this data available. Um, we 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 do we do uh, work with with academia. We work with governments. We work with stock exchanges to make that data available. Actually, any single one of you can go onto our website and pull out any any uh, data from any other company, which you probably think of as, as your competitors. And um, it's close to CDP. That's all I want to tell you to do. So, um, maybe on the disclosure questions, I think, um, as I said, like disclosure is only the first step. And is now we are in step two already, or step three, about making commitment and then also um, disclosing, uh, communicating our transition plan. So I think. Um, disclosure would help highlight some of the hotspots and track the process at least that we know that maybe emissions is increasing but then it also highlight where the problem lies and then allows people to act on that accordingly and I think with all the commitment that's been made um, I, I would choose to be um, optimistic on that um, um, and try to believe that it uh, some of the commit or all the commitment would be delivered and um, I think on the um, role of the non-state actors. Uh, this is not a CLP position, but my personal belief that um, I think when, of course, they're concerned about in what form the fundings would come. But I think it's very clear that um, commitment or the need for mitigation and adaptation are presenting new opportunities. And that's where businesses could come in. So um, one way or the other, whether where the funding comes from, I think there will be opportunities. And that's what business could play an important role. Uh, very briefly, uh, Grace, thanks for the comments. Uh, meet Franca, which is, I hope I don't put you on the spot. It's the first time we, be we have again an, an intern in our office, which actually travels from Europe to Hong Kong. And it's the first time since two or three years. And the reason why it's possible again is because Hong Kong is opening up again. So I think the whole talent question will sort of work out in the favor of Hong Kong because people see it's again possible to travel. Having said that, we started after this last meeting that I mentioned, uh, the Eurocham set up the Sustainable Finance Working Group. They took the whole talent question very seriously. They started a mentoring program. You might have been associated with it. If not, I'm happy to put you in touch. But basically with the same question, how can we actually make more talent available? Uh, and how can European industry, banks, and otherwise help uh, with that. Huh? Our office more than happy to help making linkages. Uh, we are in touch with universities, uh, and, and I think it's a very important part of our work. Uh, also, I think in the policy address, the measures that were announced, maybe not yet perfect, but no one is perfect, but at least it gives already a good kind of incentive for some people to, to come to Hong Kong. And I think on this issue, we need to work all together. Huh? The question from two colleagues, I mean Deloitte, huh? sorry, I didn't catch your name, and in the back, um, I, I feel you, and I'm not sure if I can answer your question. The only thing, as an observer, I have two, three comments which go a bit outside my, my job. Huh? One is, if you are a captain of industry, you do often have children yourself, grandchildren, family members, friends. I don't understand if you are in the top of your industry, why you still work, why you go to a COP meeting with the idea, oh, I need to lobby for the interest of my company. Of course, it's part of your job. But I think the cynicism might go away when captains of industry start talking about climate change a bit outside their immediate kind of business interest. And I buy into the whole idea that this should be commercially 
interesting as well. Otherwise, I mean, who, who's benefiting if business doesn't do business anymore? But I still think there's a little bit more that can be done by the industry to show that they're not only concerned about their specific sector, reporting requirements, etc., but actually that they are concerned with the whole story that Professor Lau just showed. Uh, because if that happens, there is no industry anymore. Uh, now, from government side, what we are doing, we go from voluntary to compulsory on, on a lot of these things, due diligence, standards, and stuff like that. And actually, that works to an extent, because then we force industry, we enforce it to happen. But I don't think it's enough to actually help solve a crisis as big as this one. And, and I'm not sure if that answers the question from with regard to the Hong Kong industry. What I do see here also is that a lot of Hong Kong business people are sort of enlightened. Now, I'm not sure if that triggers down to the level where we want them to be. But for sure, if we organize events on climate change and if we have meetings uh, also with the big companies here, I do see quite a willingness to sort of move that direction. Uh, but I've been too short in Hong Kong to read that for, for it, its pure value. If it doesn't happen, bring in the kids. Bring in the young generation. I miss them here. In Europe, they are the ones going out there to ask these business people to start changing around. Now, I don't want to provoke any revolution here. Eh? Don't get me wrong. But I mean, by actually bringing your students and meeting those business people. We had at the Rethink a wonderful forum. And, and again, Chris, congratulations. We organized a youth panel there. And I think we even got some of your students to come and, and not, not do a panel discussion like this, uh, make it a debate, one side against the other. Is green finance only working for greenwashing or is actually helping climate change? And, and, and look at what these young people come up with ideas. And then the next step, but I mean, I, Hong Kong is not yet ready for it, but tell me when, when Hong Kong is, uh, let these young people debate with the government officials. Let a minister, let, let a secretary, whatever ministry, have a discussion in front of the cameras with a young, young uh, talent. Uh, I hope maybe Professor Lau, we can organize that. And then the next level is you can do the same with get the chief of CLP involved with a student or whoever. I'm sure that your company wouldn't mind that. That might actually create a, a, a bit more solid awareness. Now, I'm very idealistic on this. I'm talking outside my job description. Huh? Forgive me for that. Huh? But just since you are also part of the leadership of Hong Kong, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So let's all work together on that part. Thank you. All right, Cynthia, thanks to all the panelists. Um, Dennis, I hope that you become a public good. Somebody in your, your organization is, you can't just download one company's report, you can download the whole database. And for that, you need to get some source of funding, which means that you can do an excellent job uh, in, make, in providing this really important public service kit. Uh, CLP for many years has been, um, I think, the best company in terms of corporate reporting on sustainability issues, and thank you for that and telling us about it. And uh, thank you for what Europe is doing in terms of the Green Deal. It's something we can learn from. So I'm sorry, we're 20 minutes late. I failed as a moderator on that. Uh, some thank you, Mr. Gibson and our speakers for the insightful presentations and discussion. Uh, this brings us to the end of the first session. And now we have a 20 minutes um, coffee break before our next session. To begin the session, may I invite Ms. Karina Chow, Assistant Manager of Civic Exchange, to share with us a COP takeaway, Young Talent Perspective. Ms. Chow, please. Hello, good morning, everyone. Hope you had a Good refresh from the intense um, presentations and a panel this morning, had some coffee. Um, now it's my turn. So my name is Karina, and I am a policy researcher at Civic Exchange. And first off, I just want to say I'm so thankful that I had the opportunity to attend COP27. It was an eye-opening experience, and I'm eager to share with you some of the reflections I had from attending this global climate change event. So I want to try to cover why young people matter at a climate conference. And also, I will share some experiences at COP, things that are, were a bit more memorable to me and kept me thinking, particularly about the topic of climate justice. I'm actually quite surprised that, like, presenters um, this morning, the, the theme of climate justice kept popping up this morning. And I'm pleasantly surprised because I thought that um, climate justice, I feel that climate justice is still kind of like a niche theme in Hong Kong. There's not a lot of people talking about it. 
So I'm glad that this COP really got everyone thinking about it. Um, and also I'll cover how the business sector, I think, can contribute to ensure a just transition, and also why businesses should care about climate change from a youth perspective. Okay, so why do young people matter at climate conferences? The textbook answer is because it's a chance for the youth to directly voice our concerns to the country leaders and negotiators. So at COP, other than catching the high profile people walking rogue in the conference center and trying to strike a conversation with them, um, through the participation of Yango, uh, the official UNF triple C constituency for young people, youth can directly talk to high level country representatives, voice their concerns, and have direct input, although limited, to the negotiation process. A second reason, which I think is actually the most important reason, is that the youth are there to induce a sense of urgency to the negotiators. Intergenerational equity and intergenerational climate justice matters. The young and the future generation are much more exposed to the impacts of climate change. We are paying the price of a problem that we didn't create. We fear for the future, and we need the decision makers to have the same sense of urgency as us. And this morning we mentioned, we're not the ones in power right now, so we really are counting on you guys to feel the same fear that we're fe we feel for our future. It's an existential crisis for us, to be honest, and we need you to make your actions now. And the third thing of how uh, youth representation matters at COP is that it's an opportunity for youth to showcase their abilities and their initiatives. We can offer innovative solutions with our creative minds and new perspectives. At COP27, for the first time, there was a children and youth pavilion. There were a lot of panel discussions and presentations that allowed youth to share what they were doing in their home countries. And this will help inspire each other, global youth around the world, and also inspire the other stakeholders at the conference. So this really, the passion and the energy from the youth, children and youth pavilion, I think did spread throughout the conference center. So there was a moment where we were too noisy and we got told off by some business people at the side. But anyway, my overall experience at COP is that I was quite very inspired by the global youth. And I think youth in Hong Kong, we are still quite complacent compared to you know, youth in Europe and the developing country. And this is something that I learned and I really aspire to be like the friends I meet at this global conference and really take action and do something and educate my peers and hopefully influence those in power as well. So the Children and Youth Pavilion was visited by some high profile uh, people. And you can see like in the middle there, sitting there, the bald head, that is the COP presidency this year, Same Shokri. And so th this was very impressive because the governments were showing that they care about youth. But on the other hand, some of us youth, we do, have, we do find a risk of youth washing or tokenization of youth engagement, which is we feel that the quote unquote adults are engaging youth um, kind of as a show. Of course, we don't think of that that way. We, we appreciate that you're trying to engage with us. But at the same time, it is a real sentiment among youth that we feel that you hear us, but you don't really hear us. So that's just one thing that I wanted to bring up. And for youth, it could be discouraging, but we remind each other that doing little is better than none. And that's why we keep voicing our demands. So next, I want to share on my reflections on this topic of climate justice. I think it was a theme that was very prominent at COP27, and we can also tell you know, from the loss and damage decisions, uh, it really sparked a discussion. And it was a theme that left a, left a lasting impact on me. I really treasured the chance to talk to African delegates, or just delegates from the Global South in general, as they give a first-hand account of what they are facing. Through hearing their stories and concerns, how sea level rise and extreme heat and rainfall and drought are destroying their homes and affecting their livelihood right now. It's not talking about like in 2030 or 2050 when sea level rise could destroy the assets or our properties in Hong Kong. This is the reality that people in developing countries are facing right now. And when listening to these stories, I had such a strong feeling of 
how privileged I am being born and raised in affluent and resilient Hong Kong. And simple daily things also reinforce this feeling. So in Egypt, uh, the tap water is not clean enough to drink, so we need to buy bottled water. So we had like two crates of bottled water. And the traffic lights, there aren't really traffic lights on the street. So you cross the road by making eye contact with the forthcoming driver, and hopefully they slow down and you hurry across the road. So Sham El Sheikh is a resort town. So this only gives like a billionth of a picture of what life is like in developing economies. But this was already enough to nudge me to think. How do we ask people to cut plastic waste when they don't get clean water from the tap? How are we asking people to walk more or bike more when the roads are just chaotic and not safe? These experiences, these engaging, engagements and what I saw was enough to make me understand on a deeper level how much higher the barriers to transition to a net zero economy are for developing countries. You know that difference of knowing about a topic versus caring about a topic because you feel something in your heart? So before going to COP, I kind of knew about this topic of climate justice, and I was like, oh yeah, this is one of the concerns of the developing countries, but I didn't think that much about it. But after what I've seen and what I've heard at COP27 and in Egypt, it really prompted me to think how this theme is relevant for us here in Hong Kong. And it's not just a concern of the developing world. And I think this is the true impact of an African COP. Having a COP held, hosted by an African country really highlighted the needs of the global south. So while Hong Kong may not have a direct role in like directly helping developing economies, for example, providing funding with the governments and stuff, I think we can play our part in the narrative by not stalling our transition. As Walter mentioned just now, Hong Kong has a lot of money. And I've always felt that what Hong Kong lacks is the ambition, the political will. I also find that the notion of just transition, I realize that it applies on a local context as well. It's not just about uh, helping the developing economies transition in a just way. Because our city needs to transition as well, right? And businesses are all thinking about and all being pressured to transition in a sustainable to a sustainable business model. It's important to think, to make sure that transition is carried out in a just manner, i.e. in a socially equitable manner. Because if you don't look after the people who are involved in the transition, or those who bear the results of the transition, you'll get resistance. And resistance will limit your progress. So essentially, a just transition ensures a smoother, faster transition. Okay, so how can businesses contribute to a just transition? This is what you mostly want to know. Um, I think when creating a plan for a transition, which is similar to a sustainability strategy that many companies are trying to look at and compile and construct, businesses must engage in social dialogue. Businesses need to identify stakeholders that are more vulnerable to climate risks and those who are less capable to adapt and transition for the future. For example, outdoor workers who are more vulnerable to extreme weather events. This would include construction workers, container port workers, cleaners, facility maintenance staff, delivery staff, etc. I think if you look closely up and down the supply chain, there's bound to be people who are working laboriously outdoors. Building and construction, transport and logistics, travel and tourism, all very relevant sectors in Hong Kong are just examples of sectors that have a huge risk of heat stress. And this is connected to worker health and safety, which in turn affects the company's productivity and overall operation. One more example is bringing SMEs along the transition. So even large corporations find it difficult to devise transition strategies and set and achieve targets, let alone the SMEs. However, given the urgency of this climate crisis, I think we shouldn't slow down the pace of transition to accommodate for the SME's abilities. Instead, we need to devise ways to actively support them to partake in the journey, to create an enabling environment for the SMEs to undergo their transition as well. Perhaps capable industry leaders can take part in 
educating their suppliers and help the SMEs with their supply chains instead of just saying that we will use, we will use engaged suppliers who meet a certain sustainability standard. Can we, can we help them to change as well? Or is there some type of partnership with large corporations and financial institutes that can enable some more financing for SMEs? These are just some thoughts, food for thought. Okay, so my last point is why businesses should care about climate change and sustainable development from a young person's perspective. If you don't need more reasons, I won't try to cover the reasons that you probably already know, which involves like the TCFD assessment that I hope you guys know, which is the physical risk of climate change and the transition risk of climate change. But let me tell you uh, an argument that from the perspective of a young person, and it's that young people are the future and the businesses you, you want to strive to continue to exist in the future, right? So we are actually a major stakeholder of businesses. We're your current consumers. We're your potential employees. We're your future investors, maybe. And you need to care for us because the younger generation, the generation who are brought up with a sustainability knowledge, this knowledge will become common sense for us, I think. And our values will affect how you should operate, operate your businesses. For example, the younger generation brought up, we will expect that businesses pursue the triple bottom line and create integrated value. We no longer believe that profit maximization is the sole purpose of business. Businesses should be pursuing both profit people and planet. And that is why you need to transform your business model because this is what the younger generation are expecting for the future. So in summary, Young people matter in global climate conferences because our voices matter. My experience at COP led me to rethink Hong Kong's decision on addressing climate justice. Businesses must manage the social factors of transition to ensure a just transition. And we shouldn't just like have tunnel vision and just focus on the emission numbers. I think that's a risk that we have as people to have tunnel vision. And lastly, businesses have to care what the younger generation cares about in order to sustain their businesses. So that's all that I have for today's sharing. And I hope I've provided a little bit of food for thought to bring back to your companies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Chow. Now, let's move on to the panel discussion. Transition plan, how can we deliver the change we need? May I invite Mr. Merlin Lau, Head Policy and Research of EEC, to uh, moderate the panel discussion and introduce the panelists. Over to you, Merlin. Uh, thank you, thank you, Karina. Um, may I first just uh, invite our panelists to the stage. We have Kelvin Gron, um, Head of Sustainability and Risk Governance of Link. And we have Ms. Ivy Lau, Head of Sustainable Finance and Mitsuho Security Asia Limited. And also we have Ms. Benedict Nolens, Head of PIS Innovation Hub Hong Kong Center and of international settlements. Can you give them a round of applause, please? Um, I, so, so this panel too is about uh, transition plan, how we can actually deliver the change we needed. Uh, I listened to the first panel, uh, which is quite uh, uh, on the high level discussion how uh, non-state actors would play the role. And then we have Karina chipping in about uh, the just transition and the youth uh, inclusion. So, so essentially, um, well, if we, we are talking about deliver the change, uh, again, I mean, uh, our section would focus more on the corporate level. Um, it seems it's more than just reduce your emission, absolutely. There are more consideration that, that uh, we need to take account into. Um, and, and back to a little bit the, the background of this section. So now uh, many countries made next year commitments, including the many of the corporates right now, but uh, do they actually know how to reach there? Are we just going to do absolute reduction? Or in many cases, some need to start to think about adaptation as well. Uh, 
Our panel will try to adjust some of the questions to see what are the practical actions that our corporate sector should take into account. Uh, how uh, the green and sustainable finance are playing a role in Hong Kong and how should business understand that. And of course, uh, we should have uh, also uh, what are the innovation and actually um, next step that we should uh, talk about. So that's why we have this panel. Uh, Kelvin have a lot of in-house corporate experience and IP coming from the angle of uh, sustainable finance and setting standard. And Benedict's uh, cross cutting between the uh, banking sector and now all on the higher public level, and her current role is more on the innovation. So uh, to start with, maybe uh, I give the floor, maybe on the floor from here, you, you speak a few words about your work, how you contribute to national uh, corporate transition, and then we go into the corrections uh, for our panel. Uh, Benedict, please. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll put my role in, uh, into context. So first of all, I'm the head of the BIS uh, Innovation Up Hong Kong Center. And so the BIS, uh, it, it says Bank for International Settlements, but what it really is, it's, it's not your typical uh, commercial bank. Uh, in fact, it is the coordinator amongst the world's leading central banks. Uh, and we are primarily, you could say, a policy coordinator. We, we uh, host, in fact, the, the central bank governors of the world on a bi-monthly basis uh, in Basel. Um, we also, as you know, have set the Basel rules in terms of, uh, in terms of ri risk uh, measures for the banks and capital requirements. Um, and we do a very extensive amount of, of uh, research, and that includes, of course, uh, thought leadership. So, for example, out of Basel, we run this conference called the Green Swan event, uh, for which all the, all the panels are on YouTube, you, so you could uh, take a look at that. Um, and, and with that, we foster conversation amongst the central banking community as to how we can direct uh, capital in the, right, uh, in the right directions. Although at the same time, we do have to balance that with the independence of central banks and, and the role of central banks, which is primarily to, to ensure financial stability. And as you know, currently with extreme focus on, on inflation control, et, et cetera. So the broader economic uh, factors. Um, my role is to run an innovation hub, and the innovation hub has been has been brought into life only two years ago, uh, <clears throat> and and it it actually started with a non-green impetus. I would say the the impetus was actually the crypto sector because uh, the crypto sector was generating money out of nothing, uh, and uh, that is a threat to central banking because central banks control economies through the flow of money in the economy through how much money they inject or remove from an economy. That's how central banks primarily do their role. Um, so as part of setting up the, the innovation hub, we decided thematic areas we would focus on. And, and quite clearly, money flow is, is the key thematic area. So payments, uh, new payment methodology, central bank digital currency. So um, sometimes people see me circulate with too many heads. Well, that is because I have many heads. So yesterday I was at the AFF on, on the topic of uh, broader technology uh, innovation. But when we discussed uh, the thematic areas for the BIS Innovation Hub, I was personally the one who pushed for green finance. I thought it is incredibly uh, important. And I do see the independence of the central bank mandate, but I also do think there is a huge role that commercial banks play in how they direct capital. Uh, investors play an equally important role discussed on the prior panel, and I'm very glad to see investors having changed their approach to investment over the last 10 years. Uh, for reference, 10 years ago, I was in the securities uh, regulatory sector. I worked at the SFC, so now I'm in the central bank sector. From uh, 10 years ago, uh, my, my point of view was that investors can make huge change. And investors can make change by pushing for disclosure, which is exactly what the CDP has presented uh, to you. Uh, and, and I think we've seen humongous change on this. I mean, 10 years ago, I can tell you people didn't really know the CDP. Uh, they didn't even know what ESG was. I was the one to run the first uh, events at the SFC. Uh, and I was told, frankly, by this most senior level, the, the CEO level, what does ESG even stand for? So I'm very happy that we don't need to answer that question anymore. What does ESG stand for? 
Uh, I'm, I'm very glad about that. Uh, I do think there's further progress to be made, but I do think we've made progress. So now the question is, uh, on, on my plate, I would say, is, is what does the central bank sector need to do about this, and, and how do we channel it via the banks? Uh, in my opinion, it's quite clear, is, uh, for example, the loan books uh, and, and uh, physical risk and transition risk in those loan books. Uh, but that's the risk side of things. There's also the opportunity side of things, which is the three trillion financing gap that seemed to exist in order to even get to to our uh, to our transition uh, to to our uh, 1.5 um, targets per annum, by the way, <laughs> per annum, right? So um, anyway, that's uh, that's the. The kind of position I, I come from right now, and, and I'm open to thinking about any technology projects that actually make sense uh, in order to drive that message home through the banking uh, sector. Uh, you would also know that the HKMA is, is very focused on this, and they have both uh, requests for quotation out there uh, on both uh, fiscal risk and transition risk. So I'm not speaking of something that is not underway uh, already or not in the point of, of realization of at least our local uh, central bank. So that said, uh, maybe let me mention two projects that we did already complete in order to nudge society. Uh, one project, uh, well, it's, we call them Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. So Genesis 1 project was about uh, pushing the issue of, of government bonds, uh, and in particular, Hong Kong government green bonds to retail investors. Um, as you know, in fact, Hong Kong hadn't placed bonds to, to green bonds to retail investors. It's now done so, uh, and it's done so in pretty significant amounts because 26% uh, of the currently placed bonds, uh, Hong Kong government green bonds, have been actually bought by retail investors, which is actually quite significant. We came at it from a technology perspective because we have to, and by you that we have to show new technology as opposed to doing it the old way. So we showed how if you can tokenize these bonds, you can actually reduce their current denomination for retail investors, which is 10,000 Hong Kong dollars, uh, which is a significant amount in our view. You can change that to as low as a Hong one Hong Kong dollar if you wanted to, but realistically we, we put it at 100 Hong Kong dollars. Um, through this tokenization process, we also showed a much more streamlined uh, government bond place pr placement uh, process for the Hong Kong government. <clears throat> Currently, the reason why this 10,000 limit exists is because it's actually quite inefficiently done. So um, there is a reconciliation process in the back to make sure that you're not double subscribing through the, through the different banks through which you can subscribe that if you use new technology, you could streamline all of this. Um, but we also showed how it could be integrated, for example, with an Octopus app, so that as a bond buyer, you wouldn't need to go to your bank or your bank app and instead could buy it via, via the Octopus app, for example. Um, but the other thing we demonstrated is how you could also create green transparency through ongoing green tracking. So let's assume these proceeds are invested, the bond proceeds are over years, as per schedule, invested in green projects. Actually, you can, you can do at origin tracing of those projects. Currently, the use cases are easiest around renewables. So let's say you invest this in solar plant, you can easily add source with IoT devices and then uh, register that on blockchain, uh, trace actually the carbon credits, which makes them much more um, much more traceable in the future, which also for the investor can create transparency. So we showed that for retail investors in Hong Kong in Genesis 1. In Genesis 2, uh, we worked actually with the UN, which led me also to go to, to COP27. And the UN was firmly convinced that to get to sufficient financing, you actually um, could look at creating a bond product, this time institutional, where you uh, actually attach the future carbon credits. So as, as a investor, rather, and there you're talking institutional investor, rather than to just uh, get a coupon, which um, at the time of the project was still low, is now going up, of course, with interest rates, 
Uh, but with low coupon, it's a completely uninteresting uh, product. So if you add it to carbon credits, uh, it becomes a lot more interesting. I would say even in a higher interest rate environment, that's still true because uh, there is a large expectation that these offsets, the need for these offsets will go up uh, very substantially, as we all know. So there is, um, be it a speculative opportunity in terms of, in terms of buying carbon credits are even buying them on a forward basis attached to a bond product. So that's, uh, that's what we did um, for, for um, Genesis 2.0. And again, all of this was uh, fully automated so that there is an ongoing, um, ongoing ability to trace uh, and to, to monitor really the deliver that this MRV topic to deliver the carbon credits and to see transparency around it. Um, so these two projects, first of all, the first one has led the government already to issue green bond to retail investors now. Um, the government is also saying that as part of its broader view that Hong Kong wants to take leadership in digital assets, that it will look at tokenizing uh, institutional bond. But I would say that, that our use case was very centered on the retail investors there. Secondly, on the second pro project, definitely any corporate issuers uh, that, that can can think about uh, doing such a bond um, is, is, is something that would be very interesting. For the second project, we worked, for example, with, with Goldman Sachs. Mm. So that gives you a bit of an overview of, of what we have been doing. And, and I think also the fact that a lot more work needs to be done. Yes, uh, you cover a point from government and then also to corporate insurance. Maybe then we can already Head it to Ivy for the for her uh, su supplementing her of her work. I know she also used to work in uh, climate bond initiative, so setting the standard in connection. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm from Mitsuho Securities Asia. So basically, uh, Mitsuho, uh, our parent company, Mitsuho Financial Group, is one of the largest uh, financial institution in Japan and in the world. Um, so our role is very clear, a finance provider. So my role in Mitsuho is to assist uh, our um, bankers, uh, whether it's like a, a corporate bankers or DCM bankers, to give um, advice uh, to our clients on uh, labeling uh, their financial instruments. So uh, as uh, Merlin mentioned that uh, I, I was from Climate Bond Initiative, so uh, um, I'm in a good position to leverage my expertise um, uh, on the uh, international uh, green finance standard, including you know EU taxonomy, climate bonds uh, taxonomy is also one of them, and also uh, over the last uh, 12 to 24 months, we've seen taxonomies uh, from Asia country as well. So I think it's very important for our clients to get a better understanding of you know what's the differences between the taxonomy and the applicability of these taxonomies. Um, and um, I think the question is about the role of sustainable finance to a corporate transition. So um, uh, I, I uh, attend the COP27 uh, last November. So uh, I have a sense that um, although I understand that at country level, the negotiation uh, was a little bit disappointing, mitigation, uh, discussion, or was heading to nowhere, but I think in the private sector, uh, we've seen a lot of discussion around energy transition, um, as we've seen in a, a lot of uh, country pavilions, um, and also uh, uh, there were a lot of discussion about how financing can support uh, the uh, low carbon transition of private sectors. Um, I bump into Katrina many times in a lot of pavilions where you know uh, a lot of co uh, conversation around technologies, what sort of uh, low carbon technologies out there. Although a lot of them are were, was you know are still at the R and D stage, but I think it's an eye opening opportunity for us to understand a bit what is lining ahead. So so in order for us to accelerate the low carbon transition technologies and you know, advanced technology really play an important role. And, and also, uh, th you know, those discussions promise to think about how uh, as a finance provider can, you know, take, uh, you know, one step forward to, you know, uh, better support these kind of uh, development along the uh, low carbon transition journey of companies. So um, on the other hand, you know, uh, Mitsuho as a bank, we also have our commitment and also our 
our mission because we are a signatory of the Net Zero Banking Alliance, which means that uh, apart from you know reducing our scope one two emissions, we also have to align our scope three reduction target, uh, you know, uh, i.e. our lending and our investment portfolio to net zero, uh, you know, target by 2050. So uh, Mitsuho, we have already taken a lot of steps, uh, including uh, internally, we have implemented a framework which uh, allow us to assess a company's transition risk. Um, we we have uh, our criteria and also a verification process to understand whether you know a company, although they have uh, you know uh, put up a lot of uh, you know commitments and also net zero target, but we have our own uh, you know sort of uh, a way to assess uh, how robust those uh, you know emission uh, 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 commitment are, and also we you know will try to prioritize our funding um, resources to those uh, companies who has really robust uh, uh, strategies in place. And also, uh, we uh, emphasize a lot on engagement as well. So apart from providing financing support to our client, we also uh, provide consulting um, and, and consultancy and also advices to our client uh, as to how they can be more uh, credible and also transparency, as Benedict just mentioned, how they can you know, uh, enhance their tran uh, transparency uh, on their ESG disclosure, on their low carbon uh, 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 strategy strategy disclosure, you know, all that kind of uh, advices we will, you know, dedicate our effort to provide to. Um, so I'll pause here and, and, yeah, and hear our corporate uh, representative, Kelvin. Kelvin, you're for Thanks, Merlin. Uh, Benedict, I'd be a pleasure to share the stage with all of you today. Um, so most of you might know I'm Calvin Kwan. I'm with Link Asset Management Limited. Uh, I've actually just hit my 10-year um, mark at Link uh, just in, in uh, August. Um, and actually, I think this is very timely because, Benedict, one of the points that you mentioned um, is that in, in, in the last 10 years, we've seen this grow so quickly. Um, and as I reflect on that, you're absolutely right. This started off with a few investors, just a few, not, not too many, maybe a handful of investors out of Europe asking these questions about ESG. And now fast forward to where we are now, 2023, um, we've actually kind of changed that role. As a corporate side, we're doing some of the education to a lot of investors as well letting them know, number one, from a, uh, from a real estate portfolio, what are the key things we need to consider from climate? What are the transitional issues that we have to be looking at? Um, and we're also helping our investors meet their SFDR requirements, whether it's eight, nine, and so forth. Some of you have heard about uh, these issues here. Um, so some, in some ways, the tables have turned a little bit. Uh, as a corporate, we play quite a key role there. When I look at this, um, look at this, and, and again with Link, uh, we are we were primarily in Hong Kong. We're now in Australia and Singapore, um, and that means that we're looking at a lot of key issues. We have to understand what the climate change issues, the transitional issues are, specifically for Asia Pacific as well. So that's where our focus is right now. In the last ten years, I feel that I've been a professional translator, translating a lot. Of, see, you, I think you guys all understand um, translating. Uh, yeah, I, hopefully. I mean, ideally, we, we get to that influencing point. But you know, the translation side from taking the science and translating into something that the policymakers can understand, um, translating into internally, how do my coworkers and colleagues understand this, um, and then even our stakeholders uh, as well. Now, the key with being that translator is that you have to understand what the other people care about, and that's really the next step of, of where we're going. Um, so I look forward to continue to do translation for a few more years. Um, we have set a net zero target to achieve this by 2035. Um, I've been asked why 2035 instead of 2050. Um, and the answer for me, it's, it's really a personal thing. Um, personal from the standpoint is that it's quite possible that I'll still be at link at 2035. Right? So therefore, I should be able to see this through. Right? And, and it's, not, it's not really a joke because you have to have the accountability and ownership of this long-term target. I could set a 2050 target, but that would mean that my successor takes over. She or he may not agree with my, my process, right? And then she or he might have to wait until I retire and then go, oh crap, you know, I only have 10, 10 years left and what Calvin did was completely wrong, right? So, so for this, it's really accountability and ownership. Um, and this ties to what Karina was saying. Uh, it's about the youth. And how do we get people to realize, you know what, we don't have to wait until 2050. 
how do I start working with Benedict now on implementing some of your digital solutions in our portfolio to expedite the reporting that I'll need to do you know, when I work with Ivy? So it's actually quite interesting. If you set 2050, you will push things back. You set 2035, 2040, it puts a little rush onto things, and I think it increases accountability and ownership. So um, that's my quick introduction. I'll turn the time back over to you, Merlin. Maybe I can quickly follow up. Actually, the first question is about the actions, right? We, we have company setting uh, the pledge, whether it's 2050 or 2035. They ask the question, how am I going to achieve it? Science Space Target said, you have to reduce 90% of the emissions. Who, who is going to believe it right now? So um, back to the panel, maybe Kelvin, you can speak first. Like, what's your perspective in this? Like when, when corporate, okay, we pledge already. What do we actually do? What are the essential factors to be considered to, to walk the talk? If I may take a, take a quick step back. Um, I think right now, uh, we probably have a spectrum of corporate action right now. Uh, on one end, you still have the laggards. Believe it or not, there's still quite a few laggards um, in this space. We don't agree, we don't believe, we don't know, we don't think that it's going to impact us. Um, so we have to work with those. We have some of these in our stakeholder uh, group. The next level up are going to be the organizations that are looking at this from a risk and compliance perspective. Right? So you have SFC, you have HAX, you have uh, SEC and so forth. Um, and they're really looking at it from, hey, we have to make sure that we're compliant. Um, and you know, that's going to be at least the first step moving forward. You have to be compliant. If you're not, uh, I think you're going to quickly find out from the regulators that they have a different point of view. Um, then we're probably now jumping over to uh, what I would say common practice or best practice. Um, and that's going to be a lot of organizations saying we support sustainability. Um, we are ESG compliant and putting in policies, procedures, um, going out there to let people know that they want to be recognized as a leader in ESG sustainability or that they in fact are. Um, and I think that's where the majority of us are um, at this point in time. Now, the last side, the further end of the spectrum, uh, I think is going to be what I call kind of the um, next practice. What is the emerging best practice? How do we get there? Uh, and I think that you've actually heard what that next practice is already. That's going to be stakeholder engagement. Um, we, we know that you know, SEC has talked about stakeholder engagement being kind of a board level um, requirement. We hear from the European side that stakeholder engagement, it's not enough that you're reporting that you do stakeholder engagement. Prove it to me. How do you make sure that's effective? You know, what is stakeholder engagement about? And when you look at it from that perspective, that is exactly what we need to do for climate resilience and transition. Because what I've said before is that I can make Link the most sustainable company in the world, but we really don't make a difference. Because first of all, we're primarily focused on Asia Pacific. Now, number two, even if I'm the most sustainable company in Asia, it doesn't make a difference if I can't bring people along this journey with me. Right? If I can't help my value chain figure out what's going on. So I think the next level of engagement really is going to be stakeholder engagement. But looking at it from a strategic perspective, um, you know, how is it that you understand your stakeholders, understand what they're thinking? That's the most important part, understanding what your stakeholders are thinking, what they're concerned about. Because if you don't understand that, you can't help them. If you can't help them, they're not resilient. If they're not resilient, your organization is not resilient. And that falls through this entire chain. Some of you uh, in this room, we've worked with you. Um, you know, you're part of our, our supply chain. Um, some of you are our peers, competitors. And again, it's no use if I have the most sustainable building in Hong Kong, if the district itself is going to succumb to flooding, uh, climate issues, and so forth. Um, so we've made efforts to work with different organizations here to share information, to share best practice. Because if I can help you be resilient, then I, myself, am being resilient as well. Um, so I'll summarize on this side. It's really about. Um, working with your stakeholders to understand what, how we link, how we can link them to a brighter future. And what that means is that I need to know, as you as one of my stakeholders, what do you feel your brighter future will be? For investors, it might be sustainable returns. For our um, you know, office tenants, it might be a, a building that has wellness um, implemented into it. Our stakeholders, 
um, you know, somewhere along the supply chain, making sure that you know we work with them and and we have um, you know fair pricing you know, for the youth, making sure that we're a business that has purpose. When we understand what other people's interpretation of a brighter future is, then I can figure out how I can help meet those objectives, um, and we do that through business as mutual, because again. Uh, it's, it's making sure that we understand the issues, we know where we're going, and we're working on doing this together. Thank you, Kevin. Um, bringing into the point of stakeholders' engagement and, and next level action. So the same question brings back into the government has the climate action plan, and they are the stakeholders. They are positioning green and sustainable finance as a mechanism or the future for Hong Kong. So maybe back to uh, Ivy and then uh, Benedict. The, the implication, the government position green and sustainable finance, how should our corporate view into this? What kind of actions and opportunities they should grab into? And, and how do you see, see this impact uh, given your daily work? So uh, first of all, uh, we've seen the Hong Kong government printed 5.8 billion uh, green bond last week. So I think uh, first and foremost, this uh, significance of uh, the or the government playing a leading role in supporting uh, the sustainable finance market is to mobilize a lot more issuers in Hong Kong uh, to tap the capital market because they have already uh, paved um, you know, a way to provide more liquidity uh, to the market. And so uh, as we've seen, like uh, the first green bond was issued uh, in 2019 by the Hong Kong government. And then in the subsequent years, we've seen a lot more Hong Kong issuers tapping the capital market. So I think that's the first thing uh, I need to emphasize. And then the second thing is about uh, alignment with best practices. Uh, I think a lot of uh, issuers, if uh, they have not taken any action yet, uh, not as Link, uh, Link is, has tapped the market repeatedly already, but I, I think still a lot of uh, issuer, a lot of companies, they are you know, in a wait and see mode. Um, I think government you know, play a really, very important role to demonstrate their you know, alignment with best practices. Uh, by that, I mean that you know, a, a label, a green label, uh, what, what does that mean? Uh, basically, labeling process uh, requires companies, issuers to demonstrate demonstrate their alignment uh, with either ICMA uh, green bond principles or you know uh, other internationally uh, recognized uh, sector specific criteria um, so uh, the government you know uh, take, took a step uh, uh, ahead and you know uh, showcase you know step by step how they are going to uh, you know uh, meet with the, you know these kind of international standards so uh, I think that is a, an other important role. And also, I think uh, as the, uh, the sustainable finance market develops, I think very importantly is that um, investors, they are having a high expectation on companies, especially those heavy emitters, hard to obey sector companies. So sustainable finance market uh, from, an, from another uh, perspective is you know, uh, provide a market access to those, you know, uh, uh, hard to obey sector companies. Because uh, if you are going to issue conventional bonds uh, without any, you know, with business as usual kind of practice, uh, you are losing ground. Uh, investor, uh, they have put in place in their investment policy that they would put a threshold to, you know, thermal coal exposure. So, which means that uh, it's getting harder and harder for these kind of companies to tap the market. So they will need to think think about a transformation on their business model, i.e. to you know, invest in more renewables, and, you know, enhance their energy efficiency in order to get more invested buy-in. So I think uh, this is an a, like a ongoing exercise, and it is you know, uh, uh, getting more momentum uh, because of uh, you know, the, the leadership of our government. You want to add on that? So thank you. I have so many thoughts on that that I'm trying to even organize them. And <laughs> that's the problem. I think uh, as a general matter, um, let's see, not only my own brain, but Hong Kong isn't yet organized <laughs> about this. <laughs> so um, actually, yesterday at the AFF over lunch, there was a speaker, as you know, which is the prior uh, UN uh, Secretary General. Uh, who actually oversaw the creation of the SDGs. And, and for me, actually, the SDGs were a very, very important uh, moment. I, I thought it was, I think, I, think, I think it's great, the SDGs. I think we have something to hold on to beyond uh, the acronym ESG. We have a much broader SDG, the SDGs there. So, um, 
And, and his observation was that uh, he had met uh, most government uh, leaders in the world during his tenure. He pointed it out as a South Korean, he hadn't met the North Korean leader. Uh, but he said there is very few leaders who actually lead with the necessary integrity and, and the global thinking. And, and that is, that's just a fact, right? These leaders that we elect, they are actually elected to do some local leadership or, or country leadership. They're not there to do global leadership. And the global leadership may, may actually, global leadership thinking may conflict with local leadership thinking. So um, he was very clear about the role of the private sector. And as I, as I just said, uh, I think over my 10 years uh, looking at this, I, I think it has proven the role of the private sector to, to every single uh, investor and every single corporate. Um, and maybe to, to put things into further uh, be the anecdotal context, but I see on, on this panel, I see you, the link feed. Uh, I see MDR uh, represented and, and, and I see CLP. And in fact, when I started running these uh, sessions for the SFC, those were the companies that were present, so and repeatedly uh, present. So all I can say is there isn't just a first mover advantage; there is a first learner advantage, uh, and and I think it's expressed uh, in in this room today. So um, in some uh, sitting beside the person though of the new, I so at the same luncheon where I was listening to this highly influential person who has created the SDGs. I sat also beside uh, a new policy unit that, that I didn't know actually existed uh, because it is very new, okay? It's just being created under the chief executive. And this policy unit is going to be staffed with between 20 to 40 people. Uh, and I would say for anybody in the room, including those leaders that, that, have, that have built actually the knowledge on this corporate leaders, uh, if you think the government should be doing more in terms of setting standards across your industry or being more strict about it, then I think that policy unit should be your target because um, they also emphasize to me the importance of the private sector. And, and I believe in private sector as well, even though I, I, I navigate, as you can see, I enter public sector, then I re-enter private sector, I re-enter public sector, I may go back to private sector. That's just, um, I, I think this navigation is quite important as well because you can bring one to the other. Uh, but ultimately the power really lies with, uh, with every one of us and, and particularly I think the, the private, uh, private sector's role, uh, including by the way, I'm pushing there for the policy developments uh, in the public sector. So again, those are just a few, a few observations there, but uh, I would definitely keep that, that new policy unit under the chief executive in mind. Thank you. Um, let's see if we have questions from the floor that you want to ask. Uh, anyone that you want to ask questions? Okay. Maybe I one one more <laughs> random thought of mine, uh, but a, a kind of a random thought that I was reminded uh, about yesterday at the EFF as well, is uh, on building standards. Uh, actually, now ten years ago, full ten years ago, I bought a flat in in Portugal, and the flat in Portugal already had the same thing as on my air conditioner, which is this this little chart of energy efficiency. Uh, and I tried to find out what this was about because every single flat I went to by every single agent had this thing, right? Um, and so I was told, well, if you buy a flat of this category, which is the lower one, you know, on, on the red zone, uh, you, you uh, will have trouble selling it in 10 years. <laughs> and, it, and if you buy this flat here, then, then obviously you might have a better outlook selling it in 10 years. Uh, and so all I would say is, why don't we have this in Hong Kong yet? I mean, we're 10 years on from that moment and we still don't have this. I, I think that's pretty, pretty underperforming as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Um, then maybe that, let that connect to, to the risk question, uh, trying to be more pragmatic on this. Um, uh, this morning, uh, Professor Alexis mentioned about the climate science. We, we are going to miss, uh, likely, uh, miss the target um, if no uh, like uh, substantive actions taken. So uh, there are also debates in the U.S. Uh, uh, because of the uh, uh, bipartial um, like the politic uh, po uh, political parties 
in a sense that some of the ESB, ESG discussion and financing are stepped back. And then in COP, we, we see this year is a, a little bit stalled in the mitigation. More are talking about adaptation and loss and damage in a sense. And companies may have pledged, okay, now I need to reach next zero. And, and there are lots of uncertainty and risk. So, so maybe take it as a, a sort of conclusion for, for today. What are your views on addressing these risks and uncertainties and how should they think and keep the momentum or walk the talk continuously? Uh, anyone, maybe Kelvin, you want to start first? So if we look at this climate transition from both perspectives, risk and opportunities, right? The first thing we're going to look at from the risk side is, okay, five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, how will my portfolio be different? Okay. And, and in some ways this ties into what Benedict was mentioning about, you know, do we need a, a, a system to identify 10 years from now, will this property be underwater, literally and figuratively? Um, and you know, that additional information, that additional projection will at least give you an idea of what to do now. So from a real estate perspective, I might start divesting from some properties immediately, um, or I might start looking at how do I manage those uh, issues, mitigate those issues from a flooding perspective. Um, last year, we completed a flood assessment of all of our properties in the Greater Bay Area. So that's Hong Kong, Samzan, the entire area. Uh, 160 properties, 150 odd, 60 properties. Um, we identified about 27 that were at flood risk. Um, and the key, as I mentioned before, is that you know I do translation, right? And one of the key things is that I needed to make sure that from our board level down to operation levels, they understand this. So instead of doing the one and a half, two degree, three degree scenarios, I anchored it according to five meters, six meters, and eight meters. Now those might not mean too much to you right now, but if I say five meter scenario was Typhoon Mankut, you have an idea what that means. If I told you a, a six meter scenario is Typhoon Mankut hitting at high tide, which tells you that Mankut was not as bad as it could have been. But now I'm telling Mankut at six meter scenario, you can relate to this. And then eight meters is going to be the discussion with Hong Kong Observatory a little further down the road, but at least it's anchored to information from a local source. Now from that, at the six, eight meter scenario, I had roughly 20, 25 properties that will be affected. Um, and immediately, our operations teams realize, okay, so now you're telling me how I can prioritize which properties. Better yet, I can also tell you from our modeling that is it the left side of the property, the north side, east side, west side, which side? So then they can have better information to figure out what areas we have to mitigate. Um, and then when the next typhoon that came through, uh, I was happy to, to, to find out uh, that those properties that were, had leak issues, flooding issues, um, about 75% of them did not have these issues following the next typhoon that came through. Um, so that's one way that you can manage the, the property from a risk perspective and then letting the um, investors and letting uh, our, our board know. Uh, because as we all know, ESG, risk, and sustainability are all board responsibilities. So now we can actually give them quantifiable information um, and, and progress. Now, uh, if I jump over to the opportunity side, this is where it's going to be exciting. Um, this is where we figure out, okay, how do I get competitive advantage? And then you said first mover advantage, um, and I absolutely agree. How is it that we know these are the things we're going to have to deal with? How do I develop the advantage? The first advantage is going to be for us as a list company, letting our investors know, don't worry about us, go worry about the rest of your portfolio because we are resilient. And th we're resilient because of this, this, and this, being able to report and, and give that information back. The best part about that is then our investors then take our case study and ask the peers, wait a minute, why don't you do this? So we're helping, as I said, through a business as mutual perspective to raise the bar higher. I had mentioned the point about 2035 instead of 2050. Um, if, we waited, and if we wait until 2050, um, I guarantee you, whether you agree with this or not about carbon offsets, okay, but if we get to 2050, the closer we get there, do you think the price of carbon offsets will increase or decrease? It will likely increase and likely increase exponentially. So do you really want to be locking this in at 2045? 2046, 7, 8, and you know, down to 50? Or are you better off looking at it now? Right? You know, we know that there's not going to be enough 
carbon sequestration. There's not going to be enough carbon offsets, you know, nature-related offsets. We know that we can't do it right now. And likely in the future, we still won't be able to offset at all. So the ones that are thinking really quickly right now will start saying, wait a minute, should I be looking to this area now? What investments do I need to be doing now? Um, and realistically, you're probably not looking at a 10-year horizon for our ROI on this. Right? So that's the opportunity perspective coming in. Um, and in some ways, you know, I've also, if I can just ask, add one more point on here, I've also been asked before a little bit, okay, so do we deal from risk side, compliance side, um, opportunity side? It actually doesn't matter, right? If you'll have some leaders in your organization that look at that carbon side and say, hey, we're going to do this right away without the risk side taken care of. Everything will come full circle. Once you deal with the carbon side, then the risk team will ask more about this. The sustainability team will do a little bit more reporting. You'll get the compliance team in and so forth. The key here is it doesn't matter who gets started in your organization as long as you have someone willing to champion and push this further because everything else will fall in place. So that's my two cents on this. Thank you. Um, I think the risk angle is actually a very um, convincing um, entry point for us to kind of advocate um, or you know to uh, encourage more private sector companies to take action. Well, f for banks, we clearly understand the risk because you know, as as uh, Kevin mentioned, you know, pro drop of property value would definitely you know reflect in our balance sheet uh, as you know more NPL will be uh, coming along. Uh, but I think for companies, uh, you know, uh, when we when we sometimes when we talk about green financing, they are uh, always concerned about the extra costs uh, linked to you know structuring or labeling um, or getting ver verification for those green instruments. But I think uh, as the uh, sustainable finance market or the ESG in investment culture, you know, faster, I think uh, companies are getting more aware of the risk. The risk angle. So uh, you know the ESG rating. Obviously, they assess from a you know a risk perspective, and also I think uh, for companies, they they are also getting more aware of the risk of not getting funding from the market. If your peers, you know, uh, you know, move faster than than your than, than your company, and you are being a lagger of uh, in your industry, then I think obviously the answer is very clear that you are, you know, your company is losing value, uh, you know, in the eyes of investors. So I, I think the risk angle is sometimes more um, more alarming than you talk about the uh, you know from a return perspective because sometimes you know investment in in renewables you know the the return will materialize in a longer you know in a longer run but risk can be very imminent. Lastly, Benedict. So thank you. So I guess I'll finish quickly with uh, thoughts on, on technology opportunity. So uh, to go back to that example uh, of these uh, flats in, in Portugal, in fact, it is about electricity efficiency. So it had to do with uh, insulation in particular, how well they're being insulated, because that will lead to your electricity consumption on, on both cooling as well as heating. Now, within Hong Kong, uh, the, the emissions actually are 60% are uh, linked to electricity. And then that 60% in, in turn is 90% linked to electricity usage in building. So if you, if you can uh, create the right um, measurement around, around this, then, then that obviously is a huge opportunity. So I think that the uh, property companies are now looking, for example, at the use of technology and specific IoT. How can you use IoT to make your building optimized from, from this consumption perspective, right? So that's beyond insulation. That is uh, that is how can you how can you adjust adjust your your usage as 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 optimized uh, as possible. So I, I think there is a lot of IoT opportunity there for for individual uh, for for buildings. Um, and uh, as I said, it is it is a very big aspect of our emissions. So we should not be ignoring it. Uh, green buildings, etc. Um, but aside from that, uh, I do think that uh, going back to the risk angle, but again linked with the with the technology uh, opportunity, I think that uh, as people as people say, data is everything now, and, and there's more and more data. So there's going to be all kinds of um, data analytics approaches. There's going to be all kinds of data related monitoring. 
Uh, so for example, in China, I know people are, are always, as, as external people, observing this social rating system and, and they're worried about it. Well, I think expect a social rating system by 2050 over corporates. So there will be satellite monitoring, there will be all kinds of monitoring, and it will be quite easy to spot a, a bad performing corporate. So the risk is that your access to capital actually will reduce over those 30 years very significantly. So I do think it is an existential matter for corporates and not just a, a nice to have. Thank you. Um, Daniel, just very brief question. <laughs> I, I saw Daniel raise his hand up. Thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, Kevin brought a very good point about risk to, to get everybody's attention. Uh, but I think the whole process is still quite slow, you know, looking at what uh, Professor Lau's uh, information. How can we get all those decision makers to really get their attention? And, and that one idea come up with what Karina, she, she, you, she, you went to experience it firsthand. And one of the topics she mentioned is climate justice. If we could actually organize trips for all these top management to visit those places being affected by the climate now, so they can all get together and make some faster decision. Otherwise, we're still talking about data and talking about uh, surveys and all that kind of information. It will not help us. We will be like the picture that Alexis is showing that it will be burning, not snow. Uh, the half of the world, there'll be no companies no insurance companies, there will be no business. Thank you. Uh, very brief, 30 seconds or one minute can try to address. I so think like he, he asked for acceleration. That was more of a statement, wasn't it? I, I think. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you. I, I would just summarize it as um, find out who influences the decision maker. That's, that's really it, right? Um, so from my perspective earlier on, the people that influence our decision maker, let's say the CEO, uh, was going to be investors. They're, they're making that statement. Um, and then uh, the, the ones influencing the investors are actually the regulators um, and working with the regulators to redo, read, write, update some of these metrics that we should be reporting on. Um, and then comes back down to your point as well. You know, another person that might influence the decision maker might be the decision maker's children. Right? And, and we've seen that decision before, uh, that, that kind of narrative before. But in the end, how do we accelerate change? It's basically who is it that we're trying to change? and who influences that person or that organization, that entity, um, and then targeting from that perspective. Any last, last thing to add? Yeah, speaking from a financial sector point of view, I think money really keeps people you know, to take action. So I, I would say that um, we need to realize that if you still keep on a business as usual model, you are lagging your access to the, you know, the capital market, to the, uh, you know, to the, uh, uh, the, la the lending. And also, um, I would say that um, uh, you know, um, money just you know uh, can't can you know wait for you to you know make make baby step changes. Uh, as we've seen, uh, we talk a lot about green uh, pricing, uh, you know, the green neum, uh, which is you know uh, the pricing benefit that a lot of issuers are expecting when they issue green bond. But the market, you know, reflect that actually uh, green bond pricing benefit will only uh, occur in sectors where uh, there are less you know uh, green bond being issued, which means that uh, you can definitely earn some you know early mover advantage. But if you just wait and uh, you know and and, and let your peers to to move faster. Then you will, you are lacking advantages, and and I think uh, you know the the capital market already tells us about that. So all I would say is to attest to what Karina was saying is is the youth booth was definitely the loudest as COP, at COP27. So the, the UN Innovation Hub booth was actually right behind it. So after 5 p.m. you couldn't publicly speak there anymore because the youth was so loud. So definitely uh, I, I welcome that. So I went to take some of those pictures uh, that, that, you, that you took as well. Um, and in terms of your, your question, right, I completely uh, agree with you. I, I, I think for me even, so I've been twice in the, in the Middle East in the, in the last two months, and uh, what strikes me is here we talk about flooding, right? There we talk about extreme drought. 
and and on top of this, I think talking with you, I think I realized as well quite important. For example, in in certain places, both can come together. For example, if the Nile Delta gets uh, gets flooded, that is very bad for glo global food production. For example, so. But, but for, for the Middle East, I would say it's largely drought. So it's the complete opposite, right? Uh, and, and I think um, just realizing that by changing where you are and going to different places makes, makes a huge difference. And I was also mentioning uh, my first dinner, I was just literally randomly sitting at the table with a person from, from Uganda. And this climate justice thing came up as the first topic. So for me also, I had to learn about this coming from our developing market, sorry, developed market and, and not understanding that developing market perspective. So in some, we do need to move around. And as we need to move around, we need to understand and, and understand the, uh, the local perspectives. Uh, but maybe just I want to reiterate my final point, one of the points that was made by you specifically, which is about our consumerism, right? Mm -hmm. So we are really in a society where we have too much uh, cheap things that we can buy. Uh, and we need to go back to an attitude of buying quality um, and, and long term and keeping things long term. I am a big believer that fast fashion is actually highly polluting on many, many levels. Uh, and if I look at my cupboard, uh, for example, in, in Belgium, uh, some of my sweaters of 20 years ago, which were made of actual cashmere, for example, have no spots on it. And then all these kind of things that we have with nylon in it, for example, that are cheap to produce, they get spots in and we throw them away. So anyway, I do think our consumerism society needs to change. So it's not only about us learning about drought and flooding, it is about what we do in every day of our lives. Thank you. Uh, I think I will not take longer time because our panelists already summarized very well in their last statements. Uh, with that, can you give them a round of applause and I will pass it the floor to the MC. Thank you. Thank you to our speakers and moderators for the inspiring ideas and discussion. Um, other than the collaboration with Civil Exchange and the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, today's event is um, possible also because, <laughs> also because of the support of the BEC um, Climate, Climate Change Business Forum Advisory Group, uh, especially members of the CCBFAG Steering Committee. Now, may I invite Ms. Susanna Wong, Chair of Climate Change Business Forum Advisory Group of BEC, to deliver her closing remarks. Ms. Wong, please. Hey, good afternoon. I'll be very quick. I, I, I'm going to catch up the time. I know many of us are hungry or having the second agenda or uh, schedule. Um, first, uh, thank you for joining us today here. I think it's a pressure to have many experts and professionals sharing their views and uh, having discussion with us. Um, I think there's a few things that I would like to actually recap for myself. I enjoyed it a lot and I learned a lot. So a few things that at least my key message I'm going to bring home that allowed me to recap here so I can remember it better. Um, climate change is real. Uh, it's urgent. Uh, the 1.5 degree is not going to be easy. It's going to be challenging. but with all the work that we're doing, it's still possible. I think we share here a lot of actions that we've been taking. Maybe some of us will see it as a baby step, but that's action that we're taking. So we have to insist on continuing doing that. Uh, COP27, I think some of us mentioned, with a little bit of disappointment, some of us may be expecting a bit more on national level, but I would like to look at it in a more positive way. Uh, we see a lot of actions and progress in more the non-state area. We see it as the more private uh, uh, companies level. Uh, let me recap a few. We heard you is doing quite a bit of small here and there, but we're looking for better next step. We're here, youth is actively participating, voicing out what they think and trying to help us influence and put in more urgency. We heard that we see new technology helping in this area, even though some of them may be still in R&D stage. So those are positive things that we should also focus at. Uh, also, there are more push in terms of transparent disclosure, which will help because many other industry or the 
commercial sector, the banking sector will look at it. So those are the things that I think we should feel positive about and keep on pushing on it. The other thing is focusing on Hong Kong. Um, a few things I think it's positive still, uh, like the government putting in uh, this green financing, sustainable financing as one of the strategic important area, which I think the panelists have shared with us how it could help everyone to take this more seriously and therefore putting in action. Uh, I think those are things that we should look into. There are many companies who obviously and evidently putting in sustainability into their action plan, their strategy in terms of the value chain. I think Kelvin shared some of what Link is doing and he's, that company is not alone. So let us continue to influence our peer company to do it. It's not going to be easy. I think someone pointed out, like, why don't we just put them, uh, talk to a few companies or talk to a few families and let's get it done. I wish it would be that easy. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue what we're working on. So that's how I try to put that into my mind and go back. Hopefully, you find the forum as interesting and as learning as I do and find a few things that you can bring back to your company and uh, work on it together. As BEC, who has been always promoting sustainability and working with business community to push on this, uh, we'll continue to facilitate uh, the discussion, the learning, the skill building, and work with the business community to make Hong Kong a better, more sustainable, a greener place for us to live and for the younger generation. So thank you. Have a good day. Thank you very much, Ms. Wong. Before we come to a close, I would like to invite all our speakers to proceed to the stage for a group photo. May I also invite our BEC CEO, Mr. Simon Ng, to join on the stage, please. Speakers, please. Yes, including all the moderators.